public session and just to advise members that uh, they are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode. And all devices are muted. This includes members' tablet devices and you can connect to the Assembly Wi-Fi. Again, to remind members that we are obliged to declare any financial or other relevant interests which may be reasonably thought by others to include their approach to the matter under consideration or to influence their approach to the matter under consideration. And any members who have interest to declare in relation to today's business should do so now or when the particular matter arises in the meeting. Also, to seek the agreement of members for the oral evidence session with the departmental officials and potential amendments to the Justice, Sex, Offences and Trafficking and Victims Bill to be recorded by Hansard. Agreed? Agreed. Item two, apologies. We have an apology from Emma Rogan. And just to advise members that Sinead Bradley uh, uh, and Rachel and the Deputy Chair and Robin Newton and Doug Beatty are all joining us by Starleaf. And Peter is with me here uh, in uh, the room. Again, in relation to uh, the uh, standing order uh, 1156, Emma has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chair, Sinead. Agenda item three, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of February uh, 2022. I refer members to pages 45 to 54 of the meeting pack. Uh, of the meeting held on the 10th of February. Are members content that this is a true reflection of the proceedings on that date? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Item four, matters arising. Just uh, a few items that we want to just cover briefly. Item one, the Committee Forward Work Programme for February and March. There's an updated Committee Forward Work Programme reflecting the work items agreed at last week's meeting. And you'll find that at pages 56 to 63 of the meeting pack for information. The department is advised of the need of one of the title, uh, titles of the meeting on the 3rd of March, uh, and the information is at page 86 of today's table pack. So, Christine, have you any other comment to make in relation to the work programme? Are you happy enough? No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, item two is the 2022-25 draft budget. The Department of Justice has provided further information requested by the committee regarding the 22-25 draft budget for the Northern Ireland Prison Service and the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service following the rural evidence sessions on the 3rd of February. The Probation Board has also provided uh, the further information requested during its evidence session on that date which is circulated to members by email before the oral evidence session with the Minister on the 15th of February. The responses can be found at pages 87 to 102 of the table pack. To assist the consideration of the Department's draft budget, the Committee agreed to write to the Justice Non-Departmental Public Bodies to ask for an update on the implications of the draft budget 22-25 for their organisations. A response has now been provided by the Northern Ireland Police Fund, which is at pages 103 to 104 of the table pack, and is also circulated to members before the Royal Evidence Session with the Minister. Just to ask members to note uh, the information provided, unless there's any further clarification that is required. Thank you. Members, that brings us then to the item Agenda 5, which is... Uh, the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill, potential amendments, oral evidence session with departmental officials. They are attending uh, today in person uh, to discuss progress to develop uh, the new amendment to provide for an offence of cyber flashing and the potential amendment to Clause 1 uh, to recast the reasonable person aspect of the committee's proposed amendment and outline the discussions they have had with their counterparts in other jurisdictions regarding how reckless is referenced in their legislation. The relevant pages for, uh, sorry, the relevant papers uh, are at pages 65 to 134 of uh, today's meeting pack. And just to advise members that the letter received yesterday from the department advising that it asked for the further consideration stage of the bill to be put back to Monday the 7th of March to provide for time for the committee to consider the text of the proposed amendment is at page 111 of today's table pack. A copy of the correspondence from Professor Midlin to the Minister of Justice following the oral evidence session 
on the committee proposed amendments to clause one and the cyber flashing uh, is uh, in which she provides further information and clarification in relation to a number of concerns raised by the minister is at pages 106 to, 10, uh, to 110 of the table pack. The issues covered by Professor Midlin include the proposed new offence in England that will be based on a non-consent and non-requiring uh, proof of motive and that, in her view, the committee's reasonable person proposal is similar to the reckless standard used in Irish law on intimate image abuse and the Scottish law on non-consensual sharing of intimate images. So, with those comments as background, can I just say a word uh, of appreciation and thanks to everybody, uh, both to officials in the department and also to my colleagues on the Justice Committee for all the, the work and help that they've done to date. And we had a long day uh, on Tuesday. However, I think it is another example of how legislation can uh, change and work and mature. And I trust that we will get to an end point that will be to the benefit of our citizens. So with that word of thanks and appreciation, can I welcome again uh, Brian, the Deputy Director of Criminal Justice, who uh, has a, 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 an honorary place, I think, now at the Justice Committee, uh, along with uh, Andrew, my bag, actually, yeah. <laughs> who's head of the Criminal Law <coughs> Branch, uh, and also Lorraine. Uh, and you have been uh, very much, uh, we appreciate very much all the work that has been done. And I know sometimes there can be a, a strained relationship between committees and departmental officials, but I, I trust this has been a productive relationship, and I think the evidence of that is reflected in where we're at currently in the bill. So, with all of that, Brian, I'll just <coughs> ask you to outline the current position regarding the development of the amendment to provide for an offence of cyber flashing, the potential amendment to clause one in regards to the reasonable person, and then we'll have uh, questions and a discussion with members. Thank you. Well, th <coughs> thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, Deputy Chair and Members, um, for the opportunity to speak to you, to you today on some of the specific issues concerning Clause 1 of the Bill and the Committee's proposed new cyber flashing offence. Uh, at the outset, I, I think I should just reiterate the Minister's uh, appreciation and the gratitude to the Committee, both for, for um, the work it and indeed its contributions on in the debate last week, which I think was, as, as the Chair said, no, notes I think a very productive and actually um, a well-informed debate covering a number of important issues, and also for your decision not to, to remove these amendments to give us time to see can we find a compromise solution which actually meets uh, well, produces the best law we can in the circumstance. Uh, it gives, this certainly gives us some extra time um, to work with the committee on the possible new amendments to be brought forward at further consideration stage in the, in the two areas. Recognising it will take, take um, time and careful consideration by the department and the committee to craft the replacement clauses, which, as you've noted, we've separately liaised with the executive office uh, and we have now, this, uh, I think we've now set the further consideration stage back until the 7th of March. So that means, in fact, the committee today is an opportunity to, to raise some issues and perhaps for us to ask some questions to clarify what the committee is looking for to make sure uh, what we're um, developing with uh, our own lawyers and the OLC um, is a good fit. Um, so uh, at last week's meeting, the committee had partic was particularly keen to the department a further consideration to issues and concerns related to Clause 1 and asked us to explore how recklessness is referenced in equivalent legislation in other jurisdictions. Uh, we have looked at those, as we did we had previously, uh, and as members know, the specific offence of upskirting has been le legislated for in Scotland and in England and Wales. No offence of down blousing exists uh, in those jurisdictions, so we're on our own in, in that area. Our proposed framework for the new upskirting and down blousing offences Inclu including the motivation it provides, mirrors the wider Euro UK jurisdiction's approach. So at the moment, what, what we have in the draft legislation is very much, when the bill is very much in line with the, that in other, other jurisdictions. The approach taken in Ireland differs, in that Ireland has not legislated for the specific behaviour of upskirting or downblousing. Instead, such behaviours are captured within its offence of recording, distributing or publishing an intimate image without consent. The offence is committed where such an act seriously interferes with a victim's peace and privacy 
where it causes the victim to alarm, distress, or harm. But no, element, or no element of recklessness applies to any of the England and Wales, Scotland, or Ireland offences related to upskirting. <coughs> I'm conscious that the committee highlighted an offence in Ireland where an element of recklessness had been applied. This, however, related to the, to the somewhat different offence of distributing, publishing, or threatening to distribute or publish an intimate image without consent and with the intention of causing harm or being reckless as to whether it, harm is caused. This is a somewhat different, different behaviour to that of upskirting and downblousing, although you can see some, some potential uh, similarities. As regards the offence of cyber flashing, Scotland remains the only UK uh, jurisdiction to have legislated in this area. It provides for the offence of coercing a person into looking at a sexual image. Similar intentions apply to this, uh, apply to this offence uh, as to its upskirting offence where the person causes the victim to look at a sexual image for the purpose of obtaining sexual gratification or for the purpose of humiliating, distressing or alarming the victim. <coughs> I understand that the committee's proposed cyber flashing amendment is based on the, Scot the Scotland construct, except for the, uh, the reasonable person test, which had been added and which, of course, isn't in the Scottish uh, legislation. In the Scottish legislation, the offence relating to the sharing of a sexual image as opposed to restricting it to... Uh, sorry. In, in the Scottish legislation, the offence relates specifically to the sharing of a sexual image as opposed to, to the more restricted sharing of, of, um, of images of genitalia. This approach would vary from that proposed in England and Wales, England and Wales model currently under development, which we understand is to be limited to the sharing of an image of genitalia. The Ministry of Justice intends to prov uh, provide for the specific cyber flashing offence within the soon-to-be-introduced <coughs> Online Safety Bill. The proposed MOJ construct will be based on the Law Commission's rec recommended approach from its report on modernising communications offences and will involve a recklessness element. Specifically, it will make it, make it an offence to send an image or video recording of geni genitals, whether the senders or not, to another either intended to cause that person alarm, distress or humiliation or where the image was sent for the purpose of sexual gratification, reckless as to whether it would cause alarm, fear, alarm, distress, or humiliation. Upskirting, by its nature, is, of, is often opportunistic, where, for example, a person acts on the spur of the moment, a person sees someone bending down in a shop and decides to act quickly, for example. We are aware that in England, where there has, there has been considerable research on this, the majority of upskirting cases involve incidents in supermarkets, public transport and schools. Some individuals may, of course, act in a more calculating way by placing a mirror, camera or other device in a place where they know the victim will, will be in order to observe or capture an image beneath their clothing. Cyber flashing varies in that it could be carried out by a stranger, for example, a person on a train who airdrops an image to someone sitting within range but it will more often be carried out in the context of a relationship where the sender might assume that the recipient would welcome the image. Moving to recklessness, recklessness is defined in law as where a person acts recklessly with respect to a, a circumstance when he is aware of a risk that exists or will exist, b, as a, a, result when, a result when he is aware of a risk that, that it will occur and it is in the circumstances known to him unreasonable to take the risk. We have been working with our legal team to consider how recklessness could apply to the new <coughs> offence of cyber flashing and the upskirting and downblousing offences, its effect on the offences and whether it would lead to any unintended consequences. As regard to cyber flashing, the inclusion of reckless, uh, 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 reckless behaviour is relatively straightforward and would favour the approach taken in England and Wales, based on the recommendation of the Law Commission. The Commission's approach to recklessness has been carefully thought through as part of a wider comprehensive report on malicious communications. The, commission's, the Commission considered a number of scenarios within the cyber flashing context, including where a stranger on public transport sends a, rele a relevant image. The Commission's view was that few, few adults would be unaware of the risk of harmful, harmful consequences when sending genital images to strangers and it considered it highly unlikely that a defendant could successfully run an argument that it was a reasonable behaviour uh, to take in, in such circumstance. That said, the Commission recognised that including recklessness on its own would over-criminalise the offence. 
He had therefore recommended an offence where recklessness would be criminalised only where it was combined with the sexual gratification modification. Our legal advice is, is that if recklessness was to stand on its own as one of the alternative ways of committing an offence, without any other li uh, limiting factor, the offence becomes very wide. As regards to upskirting and downblousing, uh, but I missed a page, sorry. <laughs> I, should have, I should have numbered my pages. Warning to us all. Uh, the England and Wales proposed approach would make it an offence for a person to send an image or video recording of genitals, whether to send us or not to another, either intending to cause a person alarm, distress or humiliation, or where the image was sent for the purpose of sexual gratification, reckless as to whether it would cause alarm, distress or humiliation. Such an approach was considered important in helping to avoid overcriminalisation in those instances where, for example, someone sent a message uncertain of whether there was, there was consent or naively believe, believing that it would be welcome, but, but where they genuinely believed that no harm would result, such as a relationship, in a relationship where, to a lack of maturity, um, uh, they were entirely unaware of the risk. Turning to upskirting and downblousing, it, it's somewhat less straightforward. It's somewhat less straightforward than cyber flashing, given the variations in the behaviour. Our legal team's advice is that adding something new to the existing offence as it stands impacts on it, upon its effect. Specifically, we have discussed the particular concerns of the committee in terms of the defence of, of a joke or a bleak stroke banter. Uh, interestingly, our legal advice um, uh, from a number of our lawyers has been that the, that, uh, the defence of uh, banter is simply not, sustainable, not a sustainable one in law. An admission that the action is a joke would immediately beg the question, how is it funny? The action, uh, the action is a joke precisely because it has the potential to cause, humi cause humiliation, alarm or distress, and therefore readily falls within the current offence. Um, and I, uh, I'll leave that element out. The so-called humour in upskirting depends on it being different from taking pictures of other parts of a person's body, and that difference lies in the potential to cause humiliation, alarm or distress. The banter of defence, in effect, defeats itself, a fact widely understood by prosecutors, the judiciary and, indeed, juries. Looking to go forward, we have developed um, a draft clause for cyber flashing offence made up of a blend of the Scottish and English mod male models, uh, and, we and we are currently tightening up some of the technical details. I think it's fair to say, in developing this new legislation, we clearly want to make sure it is as, as robust as it can be, and certainly we still have a few days' work to, to, to achieve that. We are currently considering whether the amendment should align with the Committee's original construct as regards the range of images to be captured, which goes further than the images of genitalia proposed in England, the England and Wales approach. And perhaps at the end of this presentation, there are some questions I might tra trail with the committee to, to, to get your views, because clearly there are in a number of areas that are alternatives to how we might, might progress. However, the inclusion of a wider range of images also widens the scope of the offence. Individuals' interpretation of what constitutes a sexual image may also vary significantly, which could make prosecution more complex. In other words, you know, it, may, it may make the, the outcome less certain. So in our subsequent discussion, it would be helpful to take the committee's view on, the, on which approach uh, it seeks to pursue, either uh, capturing pictures of genitalia or more, broad, uh, more general sexual images. The draft clause also inserts a recklessness element similar to England and Wales Law Commission recommend, recommended approach, where reckless, recklessness would be tied in with sexual gratification. And again, that's something else we can pick up after this, I, I finish uh, this presentation. On upskirting and downblousing, we are conscious of the particular issues raised by our legal advisers. However, in recognising the committee's concerns, we have considered a potential way forward whereby recklessness could form part of the Clause 1 offences. We would hope this would go some way to addressing the concerns of the committee without over-criminalising the young and the vulnerable. Our proposed construct would differ from the cyber-flashing offence where we would not seek to combine recklessness with sexual gratification. This is on the basis that it would not work in law and because the motivation is already one of the alternative factors for committing the offence. Adding recklessness would potentially make it actually more difficult to prove the offence rather than less. Uh, our proposed approach will therefore uh, com uh, comprise providing a standalone recklessness provision, in essence a third separate component where it would not form part of the current motivations. 
Within this additional reckless element, a person A would commit an offence if, after the current description of the offences in clauses 1, 2, 71A and 71B, is added a further subclause along the lines A does so reckless, recklessly as to whether B is humiliated, alarmed or distressed, and B is in fact humiliated, alarmed or distressed. And again, I'd, I'd welcome the committee's thoughts on that. We note that you know, we have, we've struggled with the line that if someone actually in, innocently um, sends, a, um, sends a, an, an image, well, innocently, sorry, if someone in, innocently takes, um, takes the action, um, and without actually in any, um, any intent to actually um, have sexual gratification or humiliation to alarm or distress, and the, the individual who was the recipient of the action uh, was not humiliated, alarmed or distressed, perhaps because they didn't know it happened, uh, the, the, it does run an interesting question. If someone does something without intention to commit a criminal offence and no harm is done, uh, has a criminal offence occurred? So you know, that's the sort of question we have to sort of come to, come to a, a conclusion on. At this stage, we're seeking to gain a fuller understanding of precisely where the, the committee feels the gaps to be, allowing us to finalise the, the clauses. My team of lawyers and my staff will be working tomorrow and over the weekend to harden the text of the clauses. Our aim is to clear these with the Minister early next week and get in the draft clauses of the committee in time for your consideration um, uh, during, during the week. The timing reflects the complexity of such drafting and the importance of getting the legislation right. So we're committed to working with the committee to develop the viable and workable provisions and arrive at a mutually agreed position to progress the bill through the final stages. I hope you find this helpful. In the ensuing discussion, I'll flag some of the issues and questions that we are working on, uh, some of which I've already raised, and seek members' comments uh, where they will contribute to, to, so that to help them to contribute to our understanding of the potential way forward. And of course, myself and my team are very happy to answer any questions. And I would just say in closing, and uh, Chair, um, clearly, this is actually a complex, uh, particularly the um, upskirting and downblighting are complex areas, and we have to walk a careful line to make sure we are, we're clear about what we're trying to achieve. So uh, perhaps the first question for the, for the committee when it's thinking in both of upskirting and downblousing, and indeed cyber flashing, is precisely what is it you're trying to achieve and who are you trying to capture. The example actually, just on the, um, uh, one of the examples which um, we have been thinking about in terms of the upskirting and downblousing, is the difference between, uh, say, a, so, uh, two 12-year-olds, and one says to the other one, go and take a picture under that girl's skirt and see what colour her underwear is. And the, other, the, other, the second individual goes and takes this picture and brings it back. You could equally you could have a 16-year-old who's 16 or 17-year-old who are quite mature, who, in, uh, who say, go and get a picture of that girl's uh, underwear. Uh, and in the first case, the 12-year-old um, could be quite naive and not have any perception this was going to cause fear, alarm or distress. And actually, um, it would be certainly sort of there would be no criminal intent. In the second case, you, you could certainly argue that the 16 uh, or 17-year-old who is more mature would know that, in fact, to do this would cause fear, harm and a distress. So you could certainly argue if they went and did this, um, then that raises the real question whether actually there was a, a form of criminal intent or at very least recklessness as to whether actually fear, harm or, or, uh, was caused. So those are the sort of areas we're trying to struggle with because clearly what the minister is concerned is we do not want to have a blanket approach where come what may, all cases where this happens, regardless of whether there's intent or, or not, uh, are captured and, and essentially we extend the law beyond what would seem to make good sense. So those are the sort of issues we're struggling with. So getting a sense from the committee, just you know, who do you think should be included and who shouldn't be included? That, that's actually quite a good starting point to help us understand and make sure we are, in trying to draft these clauses, we are adequately reflect uh, the committee's position. And of course, the minister will have her own view as well, of course, so we have to make sure we get the yes. right balance. We won't want to exclude that or else we would be in real dangerous territory. Uh, uh, the, the, we don't want the wrath of the minister uh, because that would be a challenge for us. But no, Peter, I appreciate it, or Brian, I appreciate that. However, there's another starting point. And it's not the starting point that you may have brought us to, but it, it is, and this is where I think as a committee there is a, 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 an issue that we need to reconcile. In, and, and I think you're right in what you framed as to what is, it, is our intent and who is it we want to capture. But we have already had a very high profile situation in relation to the Skillen case. And if you take the commentary that Professor McGlynn has made, not only on the back of the evidence that was given by the committee by the minister when she last was here, but also on the back of 
the commentary that was made in the House uh, during the week. Clearly, Professor McLennan, who is someone who, as a committee, we have taken evidence from uh, before, does not come nor land at the same place uh, an interpretation of, of the way in which all of this is being framed. And I suppose, and, and I, I say this as a member, not, not as, as the chair, uh, but my, my role as chair here is to try and get the committee get its, uh, its consensual uh, approach and that's what I've endeavoured to do in this process to date. So we'll come to members in a moment. But in terms of, of that, I have no doubt there will be a question in their mind. We have the commentary from, from yourselves in terms of the department and the minister, but it is at variance with what is being interpreted by the comments from Professor Midland. So therefore, that leads us to the place as to where do we want to land this in the best possible way that gives us the outcome that we the ideally that we want. Yeah. Well, if I can respond, Chair, um, uh, we found Professor McLean's interesting letter from an academic, and, uh, and of course the Minister will respond to that. She made, makes a number of, uh, of, of interesting points which um, clearly, in fact, we will reflect upon. But the, the truth is, this is an academic lawyer talking, talking from a particular perspective. Uh, I've spoken to lawyers, including some people in, in our who would have prosecuted this case um, under either the old law or the new law. And it's quite clear that the clear advice I'm getting is, in fact, that the law we're proposing would have covered it adequately. Um, though, actually, of course, what it was actually being prosecuted as was, was actually relating to um, uh, essentially sort of um, pu outraging public decency. That's quite a different sort of law, because ultimately the test was whether the public could have been outraged, not about the motivation of the individual. But clearly, the, 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 the court, although it wasn't required to look at the motivation, I think certainly, um, I just even just taking a weak quote from the judgment, which you may find helpful. Um, this was, of course, not necessary for them to talk about actually the, 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 um, uh, about the motive. The, um, the, 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 in making the judgment, and I quote, the act committed by the defendant could not have had any innocuous purpose. The panel found, as a question of fact, the acts of the defendant were lewd, obscene, and disgusting. The panel made this finding without regard to the motive of the defendant at the relevant times. Now, the reality was the, the act, from what, what the panel actually found, if had it gone in under the new, under the new legislation, it would have been picked up. So that's, that's actually it's a fact. Now, it's interesting to talk about the difference between an existing law, which is our racing public decency, and a law which we're, we are focusing on motivation, following the same sort of model as other parts of the UK. So this is actually law which is in, in, in uh, operation in other parts, uh, and it certainly seems to be working. Well, certainly, though, in fact, clearly we're keeping a close eye on that. So uh, I'm, whereas I find, you know, the, the professor makes some interesting points, uh, I think we're confident that the approach we're taking makes good sense. If, as perhaps she seems to suggest, you, we should actually tear up the whole legislation and start again, um, and that's clearly, I suppose, maybe what the, panel, the committee might consider. But at the same time, we're not going to do it actually to a week or two before actually final consideration. In that situation, we are talking about actually moving away from this and, start, and rewriting the whole, the whole clauses, which you're talking about in the next mandate. Now, I have to say, there's a law commission, and she refers to that and says, why don't we jump onto the law commission's bandwagon? We've spoken to the law commission. The law commission are having exactly the same problem we're having about that base, base defence, the problem about overcriminalisation, and they're struggling with that in the moment, and they have not come to a conclusion. So at the end of the day, I suppose for the committee, the question is, should we, because you know, there are, you know, allegedly there's a better way of doing this going forward, and indeed we may even get advice from the law commission to this, and the, uh, well, they may report in the spring, sometime in the next two or three years, that might turn into some form of law, which may or may not re precisely reflect what they're saying. The question for the committee is, are we just going to say, well, let's hold fire until we get resolution there, and then we move? Or are we going to say, here's actually an area where we cover a good bit of the ground, where both the police and the PPS have made it very clear that this would be a very beneficial bit of law, which they would find would be helpful in most cases. So, you know, do we move now and actually cover most of the problem, recognising we can, there may be some other areas we want to move on in the future, um, or, do, or do, do we actually sort of uh, say, well, if we take the professor's model, then in fact we are. This is, she's not talking about making a minor change 
um, to the, the draft we have. She's talking about a root and, root and branch change. That is not deliverable at this stage in the mandate. I mean, as simple as that, Chair. So, you know, the question is, what, 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 what's, what's your intent? <coughs> what do you think we should do? Do you think we should be legislating to actually pick up this offence now? And then with the, the, the current legislation, with the prospect of adding additional elements in, if necessary, um, or do you believe, in fact, it would be better to actually we didn't, didn't legislate at all? And two or three years down the line, down the line we may legislate. Um, it's, um, those seem to be the stark choices. Yeah. Okay. Peter? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that. I suppose to pick up a couple of those points. Um, I mean, first of all, I think that, that uh, neither the committee nor the department should get itself into a position where we're in a sort of call it a Ukraine border type um, scenario. I don't think Absolutely. anybody should be looking to uh, create almost a nuclear type option. If either on the one no. hand, the department saying we're so unhappy with what the committee is uh, would bring forward that uh, we'd have to consider pulling the legislation. On the flip side of the coin, I don't think anybody of the committee is would be saying um, that um, we want everything torn up either in that, in that regard. I think there is advantage in getting legislation through, getting it through uh, promptly in that regard, but also doing our best to try and get it, get it right. And I think that means reaching sort of solutions. Um, second point I suppose I would make in relation to that, I, I, there has been considerable, my, to some extent I think we got a little bit careful that the Enniskillen case or any individual case that it doesn't become so totemic that we take one individual case and we try and um, either use, depending upon your point of view, justification to say either the legislation is inadequate or indeed have a level of confidence that it will cover in all situations from a single case. So. With that in mind, I would I'd just make a couple of points in terms of what, what you've said. I think on the cyber flashing, um, you'd indicated that obviously recklessness can be incorporated. Uh, I suppose you'd pose the question, but we just give my answer, at least in relation to that, on the scope of, of that. And I think if you're saying, should this be more narrowly limited to genitalia or should this be wider sexual imagery, uh, my preference, I think, to cover the situation that it actually should be the wider sexual imagery and I think that that would be uh, my view on that. I was struck by, and it actually came down, it actually I think echoed a comment which I think I'd made possibly with the Minister when she was here, uh, I'm trying to think was it last week, I'm sort of losing a little bit of track of time to be honest on it, in relation to the, um, the bills. And, uh, we looked at that stage of reasonableness, we're looking at the issue of recklessness I suppose now. And the issue was, if you like, that if, if something was made an additional part of the hurdle, there was a danger of it becoming, um, it would make it sort of more difficult to get a prosecution. And I think from that perspective, I think I made it at the time, it's whether essentially it's, it's put as an alternative limb or conjunctive with what is there. Now, you seem to have outlined a um, perspective route which takes the a formula around recklessness which... which would be the, like a third subset. Yeah. No, I regard. think it's actually a workable model, actually. Uh, well, I, look, I, I would tend to agree with you, and again, without, without prejudice to the wider position of the executive, that would be one I think that, that I could certainly live with. I suppose the only point I would also make, just by way of a final consideration, I, look, I don't think anybody will want to over-criminalise uh, people in circumstances where a criminal prosecution would not be in the public interest. However, what I would also say is there is always a slight danger of, when we talk of overcriminalisation, of also slightly overplaying that card from a practical point of view as well. Because you raise the point, for example, and draw the distinction um, between, um, shall we say, a, a potentially naive 12-year-old and a more mature 16-year-old yeah. on that basis. Um, I suppose naivety and maturity doesn't, don't always necessarily always correspond with the age but that's by the by but to some extent I think with any of these examples you can always take call it a reasonably extreme example it, it does strike me that I think one of the levels of safeguard that is always going to be there will be if you if we take a relatively absurd example and I'm not accusing you of, of producing a, but call it an extreme example and circumstances where it is very clear that there wasn't really any particular criminal intent um, even if if it ticks the boxes of what is there in the legislation, 
I, look, I think there will always be, in those circumstances, as with lots of other offences as well, a level of, of um, judgment call that will be made by the police, by the prosecution service. And I think if we take the 12-year-old looking to uh, see what colour underwear somebody has on, to use your example, uh, you know, I would find it extremely um, <laughs> unlikely that I think the police would, would prosecute under those sort of set, set of circumstances. So I, I think in ensuring that we don't over-criminalise, we also, though, have got to be in such a way that we don't draw things so narrowly that we also actually prevent criminal cases happening where they, where they should happen. So I think that's where the balance is to be struck. To my mind, on that basis, therefore, I think, um, and again, I'm, I'm happy enough to hear others' views in relation to this, I think in terms of the balance, to add in a third limb of recklessness as regards the downblazing and upskirting, if I, if I picked you up correctly, um, and then also to add the recklessness uh, as regards sexual imagery on the cyber flashing seems to be um, a reasonable landing space, which I think, uh, I think, if you're indicating obviously those potentially being considered by the department, uh, and certainly from my point of view, I think that, that there could be a level of coalescence around. But I suppose that's more of a comment, really, Chair Ron. Yeah, yeah but I, th I think that's the if I can respond to the way we want to have this conversation. Points. Yes, actually, right. you know, I, I think it would be a high level of agree agreement here, actually, um, Peter. But uh, just, I suppose on the recklessness bit, when I was looking at that example, really what I was trying to actually tease out was A, the fact you know, there, there, are, there are lines you, have, you may have to draw. And perhaps one of the way we're suggesting you get re we make that a bit clearer is on the recklessness. Now, if someone's got an intent, that's caught by what's there at the moment. Mm -hmm. If you're going for recklessness, really, what we're saying, in fact, we're op opting for the one where, uh, where there's recklessness and actually there's harm done, i.e., in fact, the person the fear, alarm, or distress is caused. Uh, because if someone actually has no intent but is reckless and no harm is done, do we actually want to, want to actually to, to, to um, use the law to, to a, a deal with that case? Now, if they have intent and, and the person doesn't know it's happened, uh, it's still an offence. But certainly, if someone had no intention to commit an offence, but in essence they've been very reckless and, and the person they've say, taken the photograph under their skirt, the person doesn't know about it, the, the picture's never used for anything, it's forgotten, uh, is that an offence? And is that one you'd prosecute? So the, I think that's where we sort of, again, want to tease out. I I, is that, is I that's, really, that's I, what I, we're proposing. You know, I know there's a slight danger of it coming into the sort of the legal sort of philosophical yeah. debate of the, you know, if a tree falls in no, the forest. We've been, we've been there for the last few days. I mean, nobody's there to hear it type of thing, but yeah. Uh, any other members? i just trying to see if there's anybody else who wants to. Rachel. Thank you. I just see the hands now. Apologies. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Brian. No, I appreciate there's quite a lot in your opening remarks there. And I just want to, oh, I had a, quite a couple of questions just on Professor McGlynn's letter, but you have, you've gone through that. And obviously we cannot start um, amending the focus of, of Clause 1 and indeed the cyber flash and amendment, you know, about consent. I appreciate that this stage that cannot be done. Um, that is a large piece of work for the future. Um, I just wanted to confirm in terms of what the department are looking at with the, the legal officers. Is, is it a, a, it's a, a blend of, of recklessness in terms of Scots and Irish? Is that what is that what we're, we're looking at? Obviously, we don't have the text at the moment. So I just wanted to confirm um, what, what you said earlier on. Well, the Irish is slightly different again, you know, because obviously it's not really catching the same offence. I think I said in my in uh, my remarks, I gave you, you know, clearly we do have drafts, but at the same time, I'm reluctant to actually share anything de in detail before next Monday or so. By which time, um, we a we we uh, our lawyers are raising a whole host of questions with with me about what we mean, how we would work in different cir cir circumstances. So I want to be able to make sure if I give the, the committee advice, I'm giving you good advice, not just actually something which will, will then change. But um, I think we were certainly saying both that we, we see we can fit in the recklessness area. We see that recklessness would be fitting into sexual uh, gratification. Um, find the right bit. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, to, 
In fact, in terms of actually the um, cyber flashing, we were talking about it very much being linked into sexual gratification, which is, is what's being proposed, I think, in England in light of the Law Commission's report. On, when it comes to the cyber flashing, I think we're seeing this more about creating oh, serial harm or distress, because we feel the gratific sexual gratification wouldn't, wouldn't really be relevant in that, that context. But what we are saying is, in fact, the image would be sent for... Um, um, Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm Sorry. my two up, actually, yes. No, it, that's what comes of actually trying to read through your old notes. Um, yes, oh yes, there we go. Um, when we're coming to the... Um, and the up, yeah, the upskirting and down blousing, um, it is where reckless would be whether B is humiliated, alarmed or distressed, and B is in fact humiliated and alarmed or distressed. Picking up on that point I was trying to rehearse with, with, with Peter, that... Uh, if someone recklessly, i.e. not with any intent, takes something which is unacceptable, but that no, if you like, there's no harm done insofar as no one, no one is alarmed, feared or distressed, uh, then in fact you, uh, we're not sure that really is something we want to criminalise. Um, but if someone is reckless to the point and actually harm, fear or distress is caused, then that's a different matter. So in fact, they're at risk, if you like, of being criminalised and that if, where they're being um, that so reckless. But at the same time, in fact, it's trying to get that balance, trying to work out where we draw the line. Uh, but certainly in, looking, in th developing our thinking, we've looked very carefully at all of the uh, proposals, uh, certainly from the Law Commission, but also in, uh, from, the, from the Republic of Ireland. Sorry, could I just oh, yes. uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. So yes, it is reflective of the different behaviours, as Brian highlighted in his, his opening um, remarks. For the cyber flashing, it would be linked with the sexual gratification element because of the nature, you know, the victim would be the subject of the image. Yeah. Um, it couldn't be on its own because if it was on its own, it would over-criminalise, and that was the fear by the Law Commission. So we have sort of, you know, looked to that direction. With the ups Skirting down blouse, and again, the same issue would apply about overcriminalisation if you don't link it in with an element, and that being, in this case, the humiliation, alarm, distress. Um, as Brian says, it's important that that co covers um, the, the broad range of, of scenarios that we might come across uh, in terms of the, the innocent and, and persons that haven't malign intent. So that's sort of where we are. We're not actually going to have it on its own. Um, the upskirting... Um, element would be additional to the two purposes that we already have. So a standalone element, as, as uh, Mr. Weir has, has highlighted, that third limb, um, which would make that uh, more workable um, in, in law. I hope that helps. Yeah. I, I think that Thank, you, Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chair. I might just add that, in fact, when it comes to the exchange of images and cyber flashing, there's also a difference between, which, again, I'd like the committee's view on, there's a difference between the Scottish model where... Um, in essence, in fact, it's the difference between whether you actually um, you send the image, which uh, the image is sent, which is more the English model, or where, where, the, per where the image is viewed, which is the Scottish model. It's now, ultimately, in fact, it comes down again, if it's, if it's about intent, and, uh, intent um, obviously, um, if you're, where the image is viewed, that raises the issue. If, if, um, the, the, if the image was sent with the intention of actually set up a sexual gratification, but it's not viewed uh, by, the, by the recipient, uh, then, in fact, we would still see that as an offence. Um, so, in fact, we would probably we'd be veering more towards the English model, whereas if, if an image is actually sent, whether it's electronically or in any, ever, any other means, that's where the offence is committed, not where, 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 where it's viewed, which we think is narrower and perhaps actually could um, allow some behaviours to be missed. So, again, I, th 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 those are the two options. You know, we yeah. haven't got a strong, strong view on either. We, I think we prefer that the sent rather than actually re received and opened. Uh, but um, I'd be interested to see if the committee has any preference. But I, I know you put one of them. Which, which one did they put down? The committee? Sorry? Put down the, the, the Scottish, um, Scottish version, model, which, which is the coerce the person, that, that's considered a more narrow scope by our legal team. Uh, and also it was something that the Law Commission looked at specifically when they were considering the cyber flashing in their malicious communications report. Um, so our view, and, and the view obviously of our legal team, is that the Scottish option, which I know the, the committee has sort of drafted in that, in that guise, would be narrower in scope uh, in terms of, of the coercion element. Um, it's probably, if, if, for example, if someone doesn't open 
a gift, they were sent a GIF image and that they didn't open it, then could that be caught? I think there was some concerns there that that would narrow that down. Um, and but, but we're very yeah. conscious the committee actually had that version in, your, uh, yeah. in yours, and uh, we just wonder whether that was a deliberate intent or whether actually you'd be happier to take the broader, or, or the broader more, uh, English model. Well, I'm in the hands of the committee as to what they uh, feel is, is a position in relation to that. Any comments, at, uh, members? Of Peter? No, just very briefly, I'll, I'll listen to what, what's been said in relation to it. And I think, today, I mean, I, I don't think we were overly doctrinaire with the precise no. wording in that regard. And I think if, if there's a feeling that there may be some people use the view as a certain level of loophole within that, I think that the sent, I see merit in what's been said by the officials in relation to the the issue of scent rather than, rather than viewed. I suspect it may be an issue that in, in the bill clerk offering a draft, the Scottish model is the only model in legislation which... Yeah. And that's a fair point. The Law Commission had set it out uh, in its report how the construct should work in England Wales, but we have been liaising with the Ministry of Justice and they are um, following the, the Law Commission's preferred model. Um, and they will be um, introducing that in the online safety bill um, in, the, in the, sh the short term. So, okay. Any other comments, members, in relation to that? Just, just one other point, Brian, a couple of things just to sort of cover all of this. I would take it then that we are moving away from any reference to the reasonable person. Yes. Yes, that would be our because, preference. Because um, our very strong legal advice from both our own lawyers and from um, the OLC is, in fact, that substantially widens the field, and I think that's, that's a real concern. Thank you, too. Uh, just want to check again. Members, any other comment? Uh, Sinead, Deputy Chair. Yeah, yeah thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, look, look, I've listened to what Brian and Lorraine have said and, and contributions from other members, and then when I... When I consider what the uh, the comments from the minister um, in terms of uh, would the reasonable or would the banter defence and stuff have been captured um, with this legislation, uh, when we think back to other cases, I'm, I'm talking about Fermanagh in this uh, instance. Certainly, from what I've heard, I've been convinced that it would. Um, and then just listening to the conversations there this afternoon, I, I'm not sure that anybody is really um, can say for certain what the consequences of. Of the amendment might be so just to simplify things um for yourself chair and for, for the rest of the committee we, we would be content with the upskirt and down and provisions as drafted and with the cyber fashion amendments minus the reasonable person test but we are open to further discussions on it and we won't oppose um any sort of reasonable compromise that uh, if one does come forward okay thank you for that uh, deputy chair Okay, and I think maybe unless there's any other comment, the other thing I suppose, Brian, just so that you're aware of of what the the intent of the committee is in relation to a couple of other elements, it would be their intent to uh, give or bring forward an amendment to the abuse of trust provision to widen the scope further, at least uh, to cover all uniform bodies and not just those attached to religious settings and run strictly by uh, tutors as such as music teachers and so on and also to include uh, a possible statute review mechanism to place a duty in the department to review regularly the evidence of risk of harm so that's following a conversation really since uh, we had the debate in the house uh, so I think that's a, f a fair reflection I hope it's a reflection of the comments that we'd had in, in uh, a discussion earlier before this uh, public session of the committee. So that's just to convey that to yourselves as a means of trying to get to a point where we can have a discussion between now and maybe not next Monday, but uh, <laughs> sometime, uh, sometime next week. Well, clearly, uh, Chair, I've not taken the Minister's... Uh, no, and, and I appreciate that view. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident I, I know where, where she's coming from. I think certainly in terms of a review mechanism... Um, I think the minister had previously offered, you know, as one option would be to do some sort of review. I don't believe if you had a review mechanism for us to look, look at this again uh, would be particularly out of line with, with her thinking, not least because we do have that clause in the, in the, in the, in the bill which allows, allows for actually the further, further groups to be added. 
So yeah. that's helpful. Okay. Um, on the uniform trust tutors at whatever uh, and other groups, I, I suppose I would just in, uh, urge caution, just purely because I know how difficult it is to draft these things. Uh, because I've been, uh, some of my colleagues have been doing it for decades. I've only been doing it uh, for 40 years, uh, intermittently. Um, but so I know how difficult it is to draft these things. And to be honest, it's much easier to draft them badly than it is to draft them well. Yeah. And uh, we, are, we would struggle with working out what clause you would put in and how do you describe uniformed people. Do you, is that pipe bands? Is it, uh, flute bands? Uh, is it actually, you know... I understand you're probably thinking of people like the Boy Scouts who are no longer religious. They they're fall outside the Boys Brigade, the Girls Brigade, and some of the other uniform groups. But I think your problem is one of how you define it. And on tutors, to be honest, that's a minefield. So, in fact, you know, I'm just noting this is, there's a real challenge to actually draft this well. And I know, but even the clauses we're talking about, now, I'm going to have two or three lawyers working over the weekend and some of my staff as well to get these things ready for Monday. Um, I'm just not sure how I would do it, so I, I'm not sure how you would do it. So, I, so I'm just thinking, yeah, okay. I would just yeah. note that, in fact, yeah, the, the um, review mechanism is actually one which I think yeah. has, okay. no, I, has I'll just that. Look, I think, and again, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the, the committee in relation to it, but I think there would be a concern. I mean, look, I think... Everybody in the committee would certainly be happy. Um, review mechanism is one element of this. I think we're a little bit concerned that we reach a point at which um, there are then cases of abuse emerge, and we're seen having considered whether to take action at this stage, and then perhaps gone against that, uh, that we would be at a later stage then shutting the, you know, the stable door after the horse is bolted. Um, I know, and I didn't mention this earlier in terms of the committee, um, on the tutoring issue, um, I think there is a need for greater level of protection there because, uh, and it, it's, it's also a slight degree of fallout, I think, from the exact legal position of the General Teaching Council, uh, which I know separately, I think, for a range of dysfunctionality issues um, has been effectively suspended. And I know the Minister's breaking legislation, but I know even prior to that, there was a concern that effectively, from a disciplinary point of view, that the General Teaching Council lacked a level of VRAs. And one of the things that became clear, I'm not going into the details, actually, to be fair, it probably wouldn't have been a particular extreme example. But I know, for instance, say, of a case which had been raised about a teacher who'd been effectively been dismissed from their school for a level of sexual misconduct, although obviously I'm not going to go into the details. But actually, there was no way of... Um, either preventing that person or at least that person, for example, then, uh, you know, probably would not necessarily have got a job in another school, but there was no sort of mechanism which would give anybody a level of assurance that that person wasn't simply going to do levels of, of private tutoring because they couldn't be taken off the yeah. DTC list in that regard. So I think that, that there will be a need, and again, it, it does strike me to draw what I think is a certain level of artificial distinction between, I appreciate what you said in terms of the drafting, and that, that's obviously where we'll try and look and see what, what can get done. Um, I think, for instance, to draw, if we take an example, a distinction between a church-based situation or even a, an organisation connected up with a church and say, for example, here is, take the example of, here's a particular scout group that is connected up with you know, <coughs> Church X, and that's covered because of, of the religious side of things on it. But group Y down the road, who then don't have those formal church links, wouldn't be covered in those, those situations, or indeed a scenario where a sports tutor would be and a, an, another form of tutor wouldn't yeah. be. So you, yeah, I, I appreciate there's the point in terms of drafting. I think, yeah. I think we are concerned that we want to make sure that, that at least... Well, there's risks in any direction that we can make. Yeah, I think, I think that what we were trying to get to, and Lorraine wants to come in, and I'll bring Lorraine in, is that it's broad enough, but yet it's narrow enough. Now, that's probably a contradiction in terms, but I, I think the example that, that, that Peter gave is, is one possible example, and in these circumstances, there's probably a myriad of them, and it's try to capture them. But, Lorraine. Yes, just, Chair, thank you. It's just to, to highlight there is um, a comprehensive sexual offence framework that's already there yeah. to, to, to um, capture cases, because this is a punitive 
um, element, you know, the person's been punished for, for what they've done as opposed to like a type of civil prevention order going forward. Um, and, and worthy of note too is that um, posi abusive position of trust is actually an aggravating factor um, carried out in, by the courts where you can, you know, increase the, the term that is afflicted on that person. So it, it's just to highlight that there's not necessarily a gap per se. It's just to think, Brian, you can um, sort of uh, bolster this. But yeah, well, I, well, I might just add to this. You know, I actually understand where you're coming from, Peter. Yeah. You know, I have to say, and I think I said this to before, my starting point was to be much broader. <laughs> uh, but as we went through, we, and actually I have to say, the NSPCC were enormously helpful because they worked with us, and regardless of what they've said subsequently, they actually worked very closely with us in our workshop and actually were not out of line with in fact, what we were doing at the time. They obviously have moved a bit since then, but um, I'm, my, I started off with the basis, let's, let's see, can we go further? And actually I got pulled back, but I couldn't find the evidence. Um, so excuse my French. Um, so, uh, but it, it is a case, uh, and the example you use, Peter, is actually it's, it's a regulatory problem. No, I, look, I appreciate else. that, and I know this is probably. And mixed. if you had regulation, it actually. And I, look, I appreciate to some extent this is. You're this talking is, about unregulated people of, of a whole range of different sort of I, variants. I think the slight level of complication, and I appreciate what's been said in terms of an evidential basis. I think to be in a situation, I think there would be an anxiety that we reach a point. And I think some of these cases would not be unprecedented even at present. But um, if we reach a point that, for the sake of argument, in three years' time, we change the law because there have been a number of cases arisen from you know, particular sectors, and actually say, well, actually, at the start, we could have potentially either prevented these or at least made sure that there was a, uh, a particular offence directly into that, and we're trying to do a level of catch-up, I think, I think, but I think if again, you don't, if you can craft it skillfully so it actually accurately captures those cases, then fine. If in fact it's actually, um, if it's not skillful drafting which precisely targets and captures the, the areas you're covering, that, that creates confusion in law and that actually causes us more problem and probably means more people get off because you're, you're wasting resources inappropriately. And I understand that. And that, that's why I suppose we'll wait and see what, what can yeah. be drafted and what yeah. the, the, I, I think it's... Sorry, Lorraine, and then Andrew. I think, too, just worthy of note is that the abuse of trust offences themselves, the four areas, the four particular offences, they're the same as those that apply for um, those under the age of 16. The difficulty comes with the age of the young person being 16, 17, where they are under, you know, at the age where they can legally have sex and that's where we have a difficulty in terms of uh, ensuring the proportionate balance and against article 8 um, human rights um, whereby you know we, we have to we absolutely must strike that um, proportionality. Yeah, but, but the uh, proportionality I would have thought would have applied I mean if we take the example of the scout organization which is connected with the church mm -hmm. or the scout organization which is down you know if it's a a more marginal case in one, it could be a marginal case in the other. I, I'm not quite sure the... And, and I think to you, Lorraine has rightly, and it would be useful maybe even for that to be provided again to, to members, there are other provisions uh, in legislation. Because yes. I think sometimes when we come to these things, uh, we can become very narrow, narrowly focused on the, the particular piece of legislation and the particular amendment or, or whatever. But st still sometimes don't get that mm -hmm. there's still a raft of other pieces of legislation that currently are in existence and are available to the courts so that someone can be prosecuted for a particular yes. uh, offence. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, I was going to come uh, at it slightly differently, Chair, and it was again just to echo the caution that, that Brian was encouraging because we're now coming to further consideration stage and I'm, I'm sure the committee are well aware that if something is crafted which is either unworkable or has unintended consequences, there is no means by which it can be corrected. If, it's, if something is brought in and if it's tabled and it's voted in, we're left with it. There's, there's no means by which the department although, could work with the committee to remedy it. Strictly speaking, certainly as regards this piece of legislation, but it is also, and this, this cuts either way in that regard, it's not as if ultimately a piece of legislation, if it is then at a later stage found to be faulty, there can ultimately be another piece of, of legislation. You know, this is not what is in law 
is then in perpetuity no. for all time in that regard. Well, the law of the Medes and Persians. That, that, that cuts both ways, I suppose. But there's, there, there's the intervening period before you can get another piece of remedial legislation prepared, drafted. Yeah, yeah but that, 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 so that, that also cuts both ways. Yeah. And so so if, if, if there's felt that something should have been in, and we've missed the opportunity to put it in, yes, there's a chance at a later stage to put it in. But then yeah. there could yeah, be damage on the other side. Yeah. And we do have the delegated power as well um, that's included, um, which means that we don't have to wait a primary legislative vehicle in order to add more categories into um, the, yeah. the offence. In fact, so that could be very helpful because when you th you're thinking about it, you know, certainly, um, the, I'm just saying it's a formidable uh, task to try to, tr to tr draft this in the next week or so yeah. no, no, to I'm, get I'm, it right. Um, no, Brian, there is no intention. I'm, certainly, I'm, um, it's something which you could put on uh, onto. Um, if you're saying that we should review, and you could certainly pick up some areas which you think would be particularly important to review early, conceivably. Um, uh, and I, I don't think the Minister would have any problem to look at this at a longer time. You'll recall when I first came to this committee, I did say we wanted to put uh, abuse of trust into the next mandate because we needed the time to work through and look at the policy in detail. And then actually because we saw it, that some of the interest groups were going to bring it up anyway, uh, the Minister then felt and the, uh, the best was in the, the enemy of the good. So, in fact, yeah. um, you know, that, that's one of the factors here. You know, we didn't have the, the sort of time which I would normally have had to actually develop the, uh, a, the, yeah. a, a, full, a, a full policy in this area. Yeah. Just, just a couple of things and then we'll go to Rachel. But one is in relation to, obviously, when there was a workshop held on this, I think it was the NSPCC who, who were very clear. Uh, and again, while I quote this, we don't always agree with everything that all the organisations uh, will say on, on a raft of issues, that's not to undermine how much we respect the value of the work that, that they carry out. Um, as do I, Mr Chair. You know, I, I was just noting, in fact, sometimes um, thoughts and ideas evolve. So, yeah. in fact, but certainly we took, we had full yeah. engagement with the NSP. But they were very clear on this issue about widening the scope as yes, far they, as possible. And they were less clear at the time of our workshop. Yeah. Um, now, uh, just two things. One, delegated power, I think, is uh, is, is an option, and uh, I think that that's something that we should uh, maybe give thought to. But I'm going to go to oh, Rachel, please. That's already there, Chair. The, Sorry, the, Andrew. The delegated power already is in the legislation, so the, the option to add other categories to the offence... Without us doing... Without yes, yes. anything, that, that was included in the Department's okay. amendment. OK, thank you. And Rachel? Thank you, Chair. And I just want to pick up on the last point there, because um, I know there have been mention of sort of a statutory review mechanism. So I just want to pick up about what um, the Minister had said at consideration stage. Um, I believe, as said to the committee earlier on, it was within an intervention, a couple of interventions with myself, and it was about the need for evidence to emerge before further, um, say, sectors, um, whatever we call them, are added in. And that's already, as you said, underneath the department's amendments. But what 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 ha what what is what's the threshold for evidence? Um, the minister had said gathering evidence of risk of harm. Now that was the first time I'd heard that. So I'm just wondering if um, what that looks like, what that looks like within the department, um, and w in terms of the amendment that has been passed at consideration stage, when would a review? of risk of harm occur? Uh, well, I can say, <clears throat> and what constitutes evidence? The reason we, uh, we did start off with a very wide canvas, and uh, when we went through um, the pre-consultation and that consultation in the workshop, with the evidence that emerged, both from the UK, where England had done some quite good research, and that actually resulted in them focusing on, 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 on sport and religion, as the, far and away the vast majority of evidence they got covered those two areas and the evidence elsewhere was somewhat sparser. Uh, and then at our workshop, we did try to bring in some, we had sporting and religious bodies, but we had the NSPCC and a number of other bodies which were more general uh, uh, in terms of NGOs. And again, the, all the arguments were very much focused on sport and, re and religion. And we did not get any weight of evidence about the other areas. Um, now, maybe some of those other areas are difficult to capture. I think probably music teachers um, 
uh, tend to be solitary individuals conceivably. Um, I'm not sure how easy it is. But what you can do is, in fact, go for a public consultation. We can certainly, <coughs> there are things we can do. And what I would have done had we actually been doing this as a normal policy review for the next mandate, uh, we would have gone out for a more general public consultation and we would have raised questions. We'd have circulated that to all of the voluntary groups, to all interests, to try to pick that up. And when it comes to what com constitutes weight, you know, clearly where we actually see there's been a number of cases going to the court, that's obviously quite strong evidence. Where actually we get feedback from bod um, bodies in, as part of that consultation, <coughs> citing examples where they've experienced this uh, or in the past, uh, that again gives us evidence. But it is one, one of those ones where clearly there is a, we have to balance as, as we've said, uh, Article 8 rights against actually um, this. So, in fact, we don't want to move the data <coughs> criminal responsibility back up to 18. That's no one's intent. But you do, it does raise questions where you draw the line because ultimately what we're saying in the, in the abuse of trust, the abuse of trust comes where you've got a disproportionate power relationship between the 16 or 17-year-old and the other person. Now, you can see that very clearly in sporting where it, a coach could well actually have influence over the future career of an individual. Uh, you can see it in religion where, in fact, the moral authority of, of a priest or a minister or whoever over, over a, a, a vulnerable member of the congregation could be very obvious. It's perhaps less so on, on, on a music teacher. I, I studied the violin for several years, very badly, when I was young, and I had an 80-year-old music teacher I, and, uh, who actually introduced me to Doctor Who, actually, and it was very... Uh, after our lesson, we used to watch Doctor Who together. And he was a very entertaining chap, but I have to say he had no... There was no disproportionate power relationship between us, and that usually would be the case. Now, it could be a music teacher could be actually leading some sort of academy where... The, they could have influence over a person's career. So I can understand that this is possible, but I suspect there's very few of those cases in Northern Ireland. So really what we're trying to do, though, is actually not pick up you know, my 80-year-old music teacher uh, who clearly there was no power difference and there was obviously no sexual relationship either. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to differentiate between those low-level sort of contacts between ages, and that can often be an 18-year-old uh, in a, a youth club and there are 16 and 17-year-olds. The 18-year-old's a youth leader, or, uh, and they could form a relationship with a 17-year-old, and I'm, I'm not sure you would argue there are a real power difference between those two people. So, you know, we have to be careful not to pick up what are normal relationships, and we, uh, not to interfere with the autonomy uh, of the 16 and 17-year-olds to make decisions about their sexual activity. Uh, so, you know, uh, but uh, on, back to your question, you know, I think evidence... You know, we, we certainly can do more to actually gather evidence. And certainly, to be honest, NSPCC, we, who didn't provide any significant evidence, certainly at, at the, uh, the, the, uh, the stage where we were gathering it on this area, um, I, if they actually have got, uh, are able to gather more evidence, and others too, that would be enormously helpful. But certainly we can, as part of any review, go much more widely than we were able to do in this instance because we were trying to work within the confines of the current mandate. And sorry, if I just could add as well, um, and we've already highlighted this to the committee, the original policy in this um, area recognised the, the imbalance of power in, in areas such as education, when a, a person's in statutory care and so forth. Um, and, and extending this, you know, that, that was against a backdrop of existing sexual offences. We already have a robust framework. So it's really about proportionality and, as, as Brian says, extending that and, and, and ensure we uh, approach it with a careful balance and who should be uh, covered under this particular provision. Okay, any other? Right, thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, I do. Just a number of points on that. So okay. I appreciate with the, this education and the stat, that's already covered. The statutory sector is already covered, but what we're talking about here is, is, is widening this. So, and, and it brings me back to what Brennan we got, but asked about evidence. All the examples that were given there required harm to have been already done. And a relationship has already had to be formed and there had to be an exploitation of that trust position. That is, and that's the evidence that we're looking at. What my question was, the minister had said that they were not waiting, they were not waiting for evidence to emerge. And but it was the scope, widening the scope simply meant gathering evidence of risk of harm. Mm -hmm. well, so what does that look like? Because that that is that was brand new to us during the consideration stage. My understanding was that, again, Brian, as, as you've outlined, 
people coming across with with actual evidence of something happening, examples, prior experiences. I have many. I'll talk to you talk to you about that in a statutory and non-statutory setting. But my question is going back to how are we how are we having a situation where in this amendment the sports coach is covered but the scout leader is not? And that's that that regardless if the scouts are are booked under the Presbyterian Church down the road in their hall, it's not the same. It is you know, and for example, the end of my street in a community hall, the scouts are, are, are meeting. Why is the scout leader not at a de um, deemed to be risky, that relationship to be risky, but the church leader is? And what what is what's the mechanism within the department as the minister has stated meaning instead of having actual you know court cases or police complaints or investigations in the pps but it's evidencing the risk of harm okay well the truth is and you asked me about evidence and obviously clearly historical evidence is actually quite powerful in itself so in fact we would, would hardly discount that evidence the minister noted though however that quite apart from whatever historical evidence there could be that, that where we can get credible uh, uh, information for, from, bod from individuals or bodies which demonstrate there is actually a significant risk uh, and there is that disproportionate um, power relationship because clearly you could, I say, we can think of lots of examples where there's no power differential between the, a, a, a supervisor or whatever. You know, the, the, you could actually, someone could be supervising someone in a supermarket. Uh, and um, who's 17, and they form a relationship. That, that isn't necessary. Uh, I'm not sure that's... Con you know, what we're trying to establish is just precisely what we actually mean by, by who's, who's to be covered. And certainly, if, if organisations or individuals can come up and, and identify risks to us, we, can t we'll, we will seek to take those on board. But we are in testing those, we have to test those against... The, the autonomy of the 16 and 17 year old and their decisions to actually form relationships and we have to test them against whether there is actually a power differential uh, sufficient to say well you know that this would be something which isn't just a natural relationship forming uh, between people and people don't always form sensible or clever relationships but at the same time what you're saying in abuse of power there has to be a power differential which actually is a factor in that relationship so it isn't just a question saying, well, I think little Johnny who works in the supermarket is at risk because there's a 19-year-old um, woman who's after him. You know, it is about saying, well, is there a genuine power relationship where that person holds undue influence over, over a, a, a young person and that influence is such that it will distort their normal choices as to uh, sexual relationships. And it's not... It's, not, it's, not, it's not an easy yeah. one, Rachel. And I have to say... I'm very happy if you can suggest the ways we can do it very more cleverly than I'm suggesting, because, uh, because it is difficult. You know, the easiest way of gathering information is actually historical, where we can see what's actually happened. And England obviously did quite a big survey, and that actually gave them quite a lot of evidence about religion and sport, and scant evidence, or not, not so strong evidence in other areas. Um, we could certainly look here in Northern Ireland about that, and we can try to factor in some element of risk, but it, it is one... It, it, it's not quite subjective, but it's not far off it. You know, you've got to make some judgment call about what constitutes that disproportionate power which actually could distort a young person's decisions in this area. Or it, you could also take into account, sorry, Lorraine, court cases that have already taken place where clearly there was abuse. Well, I've said we, we will obviously yeah. take historical cases, yeah. you know, and those are actually powerful because we can actually see yeah. them. Although the, the, so then problem the, is taking place. the problem with historical cases is if it's not against the law, then you won't get a historical case in, in our records. Because if there was an abuse of power and a relationship was formed uh, in, in the community setting, not a statutory setting, um, that wouldn't be deemed to be a criminal offence. Now, if there was other sexual offending, uh, and there was abuse of power, that, does, uh, becomes an aggravating says, that would factor. actually be an aggravating factor and that we would pick that up. But I'm just saying, if you had that sort of power, if your um, minister forms a relationship with a 17-year-old, um, at the moment, at the moment it, wouldn't be necessary, it wouldn't be unlawful. In fact, the 17-year-old made a choice, yes, I want to have a sexual relationship with that minister. Uh, but it's only if, you know, um, if we had the, um, the new law in, then that would actually be quite different because ultimately we would deem that to be a relationship of power and, and therefore that, that action would not be acceptable. And that's where we're going. But the truth is, Peter, it's where we draw lines. 
you know, what you're saying, we should draw a line a bit further to pick up a few more bodies, but how do we do it in a way which is actually meaningful in law? But it's, it's not about access to children. I think this is where it gets a bit confused. It is about that power imbalance. And, you know, just seeing the potential that this could happen, I can see this happening, is different from the evidence of risk. Um, and as, as Brian quite rightly points out, there was a body of evidence that we looked at. Uh, England and Wales, the Ministry of Justice, carried out very comprehensive review across a number of workshops. Um, we carried out our workshop. We, we had difficulties trying to get the right representation at that. Um, with NSPCC, it was difficult to get, for example, umbrella groups that would, would um, represent the interests of tutors and, and things like that. So it was very difficult for us to try, try and gather that. And another important uh, point was when NSPC, NSPCC first approached us, it was in the guise of, whilst it's the national um, closing the, the loophole, um, their particular concerns were about sport and religion at that point, and they, they brought along representatives of those organisations to, to chat through. And, and whenever we looked at this um, in terms of the workshop, we looked at what other safeguarding mechanisms there, there were in place, as well as existing law. Um, so we did, we did uh, look at this uh, very carefully. There's also, as you say, I know it's about um, looking at, at high-profile cases and historic cases. That's an element that, that reflects uh, you know, where these incidents might happen. But it is also, um, the NSBCC carried out a piece of research in England and Wales around local authorities and sports and religion were the two top areas where you know, persons had come engage with those lo local authorities over concerns about um, persons and trust. So there was a body looked at, um, if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Members, if there's no other... Uh, sorry, Rachel, yes? Thank you, sorry. It's just to come back, just, uh, just in terms of all the conversations that have been had, though, is this about evidence of risk of harm? What is... like? And this is, I keep coming back to this because this was the clarification from the minister whenever it was about evidence of abuse of trust or is it evidence of risk of harm? Sorry, repeat that because I missed the first part of that. Evidence no problem. Of, of risk of harm because that is what the minister told me on the floor of the House and consideration stage when I questioned about the evidence threshold of what is this going to be to add new areas in, scout leaders, and whatever. Okay. What is the evidence of risk of harm? Because if that wasn't the top, if that wasn't the conversation or the basis of which we're having conversations about developing this amendment, then that's a whole different topic. If we're just looking at evidence of what has gone before or what hasn't gone before because it wasn't illegal, so you know we don't we don't have that. But if we're looking at evidence of a of risk of harm rather than evidence of what's gone on before, those are two different things. They are two different things, but I think you would look at both. Uh, I'm not sure why you wouldn't look at historical evidence where it's available. On the evidence of risk of harm, clearly that's something which we've had, to, as I told you, you know, we, we, our aim was to take a much longer look at this, actually, than we were able to in the end, and consequently we had to work with what we had. And certainly we brought a range of bodies for that workshop, and we did not start with any preconceived notion. You know, I've been doing policy too long to start off on that sort of route. We start off on the basis of well, what should we be covering, and uh, I, we had quite a wide sort of, um, uh, quite a wide sort of uh, range of potential scenarios. But the reality was, what, what we did get back was actually both evidence has happened in the past, and we had re very real concerns from bodies who actually run sporting organisations and religious bodies that they felt this was an issue for them, and actually there was a risk that, in fact, it would continue to be an issue and cases would continue to occur. Now, that was actually them giving us both actually historical lines, but certainly they've, they're practical experience from their own actually, uh, um, sectors that there were risks which they saw and which they couldn't cope with and they felt the law had to cope with. Now, we got that from them. We didn't get that from anyone else. Now, um, and certainly the NSPCC were there and they did focus on those two areas. And I did say to them at the time that, in fact, we were, we were, we were looking to make this as broad as made sense so we weren't, we weren't open, just as we, well, I wasn't dictating what type of bodies there came. The NSPC were co-organised co, co that workshop. And so, in fact, and I discussed it with them, who, who should be included. We wanted a good wide range of people to go beyond sports and religion. And then what, what we got was what we got. 
and not all organisations that we invited came. And certainly the NSPCC had, uh, as a co-organiser, had every opportunity to actually add to the list. Uh, we, we weren't being in any way exclusive on that one. So, you know, in this one, actually, Rachel, I think I've answered the question. The bottom line is, you know, clearly we look at historical areas, but certainly where we get credible organisations coming and actually pointing out to their real concerns about risk, and they can see that we've based on their past experience and their perception of risk, um, that, that was very helpful. And now, and on the, okay. the, on the um, scouts and others, you know, I certainly, in fact, if we, uh, as I've said, you know, what we've tried to do is produce legislation which is workable. Uh, now, if, we can, if you can uh, contrive to produce a simple formula which actually brings in the scouts in, in addition to other groups um, in a way which is actually meaningful and works in law, then, then fine. But I'm, what I'm just saying is, in fact, you know, at the moment, I haven't had any evidence. No, I have not heard any. Now, in fairness, in fact, I haven't spoken to scouts organisations, but at the same time, that they could have come along at that workshop and the NSPCC could have brought them along at the workshop. But also I can say that I had to go in what we had, and that's where we are at the moment. What we have done is because, partially, because we had concerns that there could be missed areas, we actually did put in that clause, which allows us to add add further organisation or further areas going forward. And I'm very happy, and the Minister's very happy to add further areas where we can get some credible, credible information about harm or risk of harm. So I, and I think the Minister would, would, you know, is quite clear about that. You know, it's not, this isn't about closing the door. This is about saying, well, we've got evidence in here. Let's move where we have evidence, but we'll leave the door open so we can actually extend that list or extend those areas as we get some cred cred credible information in. Okay. Yep. Okay, members, if there's no other questions, uh, I think we'll draw this to a conclusion. I think that's been useful to try and maybe solidify some thoughts in relation to these issues. Brian, uh, I know you and Andrew are staying on, so I'm just going to thank Lorraine. <laughs> well, thank you as well for your contribution <laughs> during this part, but thanks, Lorraine, and uh, you're, you're getting escaped. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, Lorraine, thank for, for your time. Thank you very much. So, Brian, you and Andrew are staying because that brings us into agenda item six, the reform of rehabilitation periods, the results of the consultation, yeah. the proposed way forward. And uh, just so that members know, the relevant uh, papers in relation to this are at pages 136 to 199 of uh, to, today's pack. And just, again, Brian, to invite you to outline the results <coughs> of the consultation and the proposed way forward, and then we'll have uh, questions if members could indicate, uh, and then we'll work our way through this. Brian, thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting us once again to give you a presentation on the Minister's proposals regarding the rehabilitation of offenders. I should say at the outset that the driving force behind the Minister's proposal amendments to existing rehabilitation arrangements is not to go easy on offenders. Rather, she is taking the longer view as to how best we can further reduce offending in Northern Ireland and thus reduce the number of victims in our community. And, and of course, ensuring that those who do offend actually can re rejoin um, uh, our community and become uh, useful, useful and valuable citizens. National, national and international evidence is very strong that if we're to make a real difference in reducing offending in our community, we must, we must do two things. And this very much mirrors actually what the, a, pre, a former committee um, um, said in one of its reports in the last, last, um, in the last uh, mandate. Firstly, to seek to tackle the root causes of offending, working with statutory and non-governmental agencies to identify vulnerable individuals at risk of progressing into offending and helping them to build up the capabilities and capacity to take a different trajectory. In other words, what we can do to head people off from becoming offenders. And secondly, to assist those who have spiralled into offending to re-enter normal society and re-establish themselves in the community as useful citizens. Where they have, where, certainly where they've offended and paid the price for their wrongdoing, um, they, they, we believe, and the Minister uh, would certainly believe, that they need, they need a second chance. That being said, of course, this has to be done in the context of public safety, but certainly when it comes to rehabilitation, the challenge for us is to set out the systems to facilitate former offenders to reform and rehabilitate while protecting the public. And the relatively small number of seriously dangerous individuals that serve their senses return to the community, we have to deal with them as well. 
There's good evidence that assisting former offenders to achieve gainful employment and to re-establish a stake in our community significantly reduces the risk of their re-offending. Unfortunately, there's also good evidence that their having to advise employers of their past misdeeds substantially reduces their, their capacity to gain employment and put their past behind them. Too often you find individuals, some offenders, return to offending because they can't cope in, uh, in the community, not because they, uh, they haven't been rehabilitated in prison, but rather because when they return to the community they can't get work and that they are then faced with stark choices. Our current rehabilitation arrangements serve as an impediment to former offenders moving on. At present, any offender who has served more than 30 months in custody is required to advise a prospective employer of his past record, no matter how long ago it, the offence took place and regardless of his efforts to reform. Uh, the offence is never spent and can impact adversely on their lives even 50 years later. And we know of cases of people who have literally offended uh, in the 70s who are, are still being, having their lives blighted by, by a, a stupid or foolish or um, a deed which is long gone. That these people have changed massively, but at the same time they can't, um, they can't, um, uh, they can't manage successfully in the community. International research on desistance from crime suggests that crime reduction is strongly related to social and civic re reintegration. Reducing the period of rehabilitation before <coughs> an offence is spent would lead to better outcomes regarding criminal redu crime reduction and it would re re end up with fewer victims. Um, certainly, um, yes, well, you must remember the number of pages in future. Uh, future victims, um, yeah. Okay, sadly, many offenders who have, have spoken, we've spoken to, feel that the justice system sets them up to fail <coughs> and is designed to keep them entrapped in a, a cycle of recidivism. This is neither in their interest nor those of our community. The current period before an offence can be spent are uh, really uh, historic and are now considerable, considerably out of date. They were developed in a period when sentences were substantially shorter and where factors which influenced assistance were poorly understood. Recognising that the current rehabilitation arrangements are outdated and are subject to challenge in courts, and noting that Northern Ireland has fallen behind the current practice in other parts of the UK in the Minister commissioned a review. The aim was to take a fresh look at the use and utility of the current arrangements and to consider adjusting bans to allow for less serious crimes to be dealt with in a shorter dis uh, disclosure period, while ensuring that most serious offences would nevertheless uh, would never become spent. Following a detailed review, the Department consulted the public on possible changes. The majority of respondents, nearly, uh, fi nearly fi 95 per cent, supported the review of the current bar on, on custodial sentences of 30 months or, or more never becoming spent and agreed that the requirement of lifelong disclosure attached to a sentence of 30 months or more does, does not make sense. Uh, uh, taking on board the outcome of this consultation, the Department looked at four options. To maintain wh where we are, introduce a version of the current English and, and Scottish uh, arrangements which allow sentences up to four years to become spent, replicate proposed England and uh, Wales mo model, uh, where that would be increased uh, down to include over four years except for those serious violent and sexual offences and develop a hybrid or fixed upper limit uh, which we've now, set at, we've now proposed to be 10 years for any kind of offence. That last option takes account of Article 14 of the Criminal Justice Norm 9 Order 2008 defining a serious offence as one that is specified in Schedule 1 of the Order. In other words, well, those serious, what is defined as a serious offence should be one which is essentially um, uh, never spent, or certainly never spent without, uh, um, without review. Schedule 1 then lists a number of serious of violent and sexual offences which carry a penalty of 10 years or more, and they can attract a public protection sentence in the form of discretionary life sentence, an indeterminate sentence, custodial sentence, or an extended custodial sentence. Essentially, the, int the intention... Uh, is to, to enable more offenders to put their convictions behind them. And in, t in looking to go forward, um, the, the Minister appreciates, in the interest of public safety, there are certain jobs and professions where applicants must always declare their convictions, even where they're otherwise spent. So whereas the Minister clearly is looking at us liberalising the, the, the period rehabilitation periods to allow more people to be able to actually regard their, their cases as spent, even in those cases where um, they are going to, to occupations or professions uh, where, in fact, there's a sensitivity, such as um, 
uh, teaching or other area, dealing with children or vulnerable people, uh, that those sentences are never spent. So in fact, ultimately that gives you a safeguard where there are potentially vulnerable people. In addition, we're very conscious that where people are, come out of, of, of prison who are considered historically dangerous, uh, we also have uh, Papani arrangements, where in fact where individuals who are considered to be seriously sexually or violent, dangerous or violent, um, th there are special arrangements which keep them monitored, um, sometimes for life, but certainly for many years. So ultimately, we, uh, the minister and the department considered that where, the, in essence, liberalising the spent sentences given that we, are, we still have that capacity to actually them never to be spent for sensitive uh, employment and recognising that we do have other mechanisms to ensure safety of the public, uh, we believe, the Minister and the Department believe these are, these are proportionate changes. And the Minister is therefore satisfied there will be no increase to public risk to public safety as a result of the proposed reforms, as all spent and unspent convictions will continue to be disclosed for sensitive employment, um, and such as working with children, young people and vulnerable adults. The advantage of this option lies in its ease of use. Uh, the, cust the custodial tiers are clearly defined and understood, uh, making the re regime significantly easier to navigate and understand than some of the other options. And certainly replacing a bright line, an upper limit with another, could give a possibility of a legal challenge. We're also conscious that, in fact, um, to, to comply with, with a reasonable, re recent uh, judgment, and uh, that we will also have to develop an independent mechanism for the Northern Ireland to mitigate the prospect of any such future legal challenge. So, in fact, even where people have, go beyond 10 years, uh, I think there'll be a legal requirement that there is a mechanism to actually allow them to, to um, challenge this. Um, and then if they make a case, then clearly that could change. Now that, that, de so that development, of course, will require primary legislation, which is certainly isn't possible during this mandate. And any review mechanism would not be practical for large numbers of applicants per year. Now, certainly setting the, um, setting the, um, the top barrier at 10 years means it's only the serious offences that apply. And, of course, there are only um, 20 or so individuals a year who would actually potentially require review. So that is seen to be a sort of practical and pragmatic approach. The Minister, having considered the outcome of the review and the responses to the subsequent consultation, has decided to proceed with this option as representing the best balance between public reassurance and offender re rehabilitation. Um, I'm conscious that uh, we actually have given you some, some, cop some papers which cover yeah. the consultation and there are the response to that consultation. We're, of course, very happy to answer any questions to the committee. Right. Thank you very much, just, Mr Chair. Uh, just one opening question, then. Uh, some members have indicated it would seem that what has, where we have landed in all of this is an option being proposed by the department we didn't consult on. So I suppose the question is, do we have a sense of what's the, the view of the same stakeholders that we consulted on, with in relation to the other proposals, and you mentioned that there was 95% in favour of, of some of those, so that gave us a sense of, of what their view was. But on the one that we're now, the option that the Minister is now proposing, we didn't consult on. So how, how have we come, because we've got ourselves into a place where in previous pieces of, of legislation we have said, well, we can't bring that forward because we haven't made uh, uh, any consultation and we don't know what would be the view, so therefore it would be better to do a consultation and on the basis of that information then bring forward a proposal. But on this one, we're turning all of that up, upside down in his head. Could you just advise us as to right. how we got to that point? Well, I think it's very straightforward. Now, at the end of the day, clearly on the consultation, um, there was what we, what we did find, what you'll see from, from, from the, uh, the report and, and our reactions, were in fact there was a strong opinion that in fact we needed to substantially liberalise the process. And I think that the option three was I think seven years, which we did consult upon. Um, the difference between seven and ten years actually is relatively few individuals because really the numbers actually of, of offenders who actually have sentences of seven or more years is actually relatively low. Uh, and ultimately, this was actually a practical, uh, uh, partially a practical issue. That in fact, setting it at 10 gave a very clear list of, of offences which are already encapsulated in law. 
to try to go for seven years, we'd have actually have to create a, a list of offences, uh, what could have been an enormous list of potential offences which could have had a maximum sentence of that level. Um, so ultimately, um, having recognised in fact the move was actually to go towards the upper end, um, the question was, um, given that there was a relatively small difference between um, seven and ten years, and given that, in fact, there was clear le legislation which already set a boundary at 10 years, which meant that we had clarity as the, the, uh, the, as the offence is covered. Um, ultimately, I think the conclusion was it made sense, given that, in fact, it was in the spirit of the consultation, uh, to go to actually a fixed, pe a fixed point, which actually was well understood and well defined, uh, was better than actually stopping it at seven years, where we'd have actually had to uh, produce... Uh, a large and potentially changing list of offences and it would have made it more difficult for people to recognise whether they were covered or not. So that was primarily on that basis. I don't know, Andy, if you want to add anything to that? Uh, well, just to slightly contradict you, Brian, there, there was... It wasn't there with us. Oh. <laughs> there, there, there wasn't a suggestion that we set it at seven. I think there's, there's a read across between other offences in the criminal justice order which... Um, can attract a sentence of seven years, but on, because they're listed in a separate schedule, that maximum sentence <coughs> can be uplifted to 10 years right. in order okay. to categorise them as serious offences. But yes, in, in order to add to what Brian had said, Chair, mm -hmm. and in an answer to your direct question, uh, we had we, the department participated in stakeholder events um, with NACRO and Unlock and some of their clients who attended a, a visual sorry, a virtual uh, engagement event with the department. So although we asked certain questions around examples that were included in the consultation, there was also a lot of uh, supplementary information provided by way of consultation responses about where key stakeholders would like to see the department take the scheme further than just the examples that were set out as examples that could mirror arrangements elsewhere that were either already in law or were due to become law. So the option that we developed as option four was based upon information that was provided to us as part of the consultation. Right. Okay. And once the consultation, uh, the summary of responses was uh, published, NIACRO have actually been back in touch and I've been speaking with them and they speak very favourably of the department's intended approach. Right, okay. They have asked some questions about minor level offending, sort of what, what arrangements there would be for non-conviction type disposals, uh, sort of court orders and that type of thing. So we're, we're doing some further work in that regard, but in terms of the big picture stuff and this suggestion that we're, we're setting a relatively high bar with a review mechanism, they're definitely very supportive of that proposal. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chair, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, and I suppose, you know, given that rehabilitation periods haven't changed uh, since uh, about 1978 or so, um, you know, th this change is appropriate and I suppose it is a, an important piece of work. But my question would be around um, the issue of former political prisoners. And we know that many of them encounter barriers in their in their daily daily lives, you know, to do with employment and travel, insurance, current responsibilities, if they want to adopt or anything like that. There, so, you know, can I can I ask Brian like, what what consideration was given to to those um, prisoners when this work was being developed? Well, in essence, in fact, that they would be caught by they would they are, the regulations about that their convictions being spent or otherwise. <laughs> are caught in the same way as any uh, as others um, ultimately in fact the um, many of them I suspect in the moment would actually sort of uh, political press would have actually had uh, those who were offended and then during the period of the troubles would have actually had sentences which wouldn't necessarily have been serious uh, offenses um, but at the same time they would because of the 30 month period that includes a, a great a great number of them I am uh, the expectation is the number who would, um, and many of them, will be will benefit from this move from 30 months to 10 years. It won't clearly cover others, but there again, if we are building a review mechanism into into statute, 
uh, in the next mm -hmm. mandate, then of course that will also give them the capacity to go for review and, and no doubt argue that in fact their cases were many years old and then had particular circumstances which no longer apply. But that, that mm -hmm. will be a matter for a, a, a review process downstream for those who actually had committed um, what are defined as serious offences. Yeah, no, that, that's good to get that bit of clarity because, you know, many of them actively contribute towards improving their communities and society. So, you know, it is felt that the barriers that, that they have to um, put up with now are, are fairly unjust. So if there is scope there for, for, for those longer term um, sentences to be reformed, um, you know, that, that would be very much welcome. So um, in terms of this um, this review, has it been um, scrutinised by the Human Rights Commission? Andy, they were part of our... Um... Uh, the Human Rights Commission responded to the consultation and the he Human Rights Commission also um, supported a judicial review against the, the terms, the existing terms of the, the scheme. So we're under no illusions as to the Human Rights Commission's views uh, in terms of what they would like to see. And in actual fact, the, the judgment in the case that they supported... The remedy that was proposed at the end of the case is actually more restrictive, more expensive, and would take longer to implement than the terms of the scheme that the Minister is proposing to bring forward. The terms of the scheme here, uh, before the committee now, and which the Minister would like to legislate for, offers more benefit to more prisoners, more ex-offenders, more quickly and without the addition of additional expense. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, yep, yeah, Trevor, that's fine. Thank you. Just two things on that, Andrew. First is, uh, it would be useful for us to maybe get a, a sense of the, uh, the reference to the legal case. Yes. Uh, if you could supply us the information on that. And secondly, uh, the Human Rights Commission is one element of public uh, view. What about the views were taken because uh, it's always this issue and, and it's not a criticism of the department it's a general comment in terms of the challenge for a department though when you want to consult on something who it is you talk to will will invariably not in all cases but shape what is the outcome of whatever the decision is on this issue where did victims come into play because there's one thing to talk to talk to the people who are the perpetrators of crime, perpetrators of terrorist activity, perpetrators of breaking the law. It's another thing to also take into account the view of those who were the victims of those crimes and those issues. So how do we ensure that this uh, is, how is this viewed within and what comfort, comfort, conversation has the department, get it out yet, with uh, other stakeholders, and I, I don't like that phrase because I, I just, we have to come up with a different terminology, because, but it just becomes part of us here. Uh, but what conversation has been with those who have been affected by the actions of people who are the subject of this particular process? Do you want to start off, Brian, and I'll chime in with? Right, well, I think we actually, in line with our normal um, policies, we actually, where we go for consultation, we, uh, our aim is to consult very widely. Uh, so therefore, we would have actually had a wide range of interest groups, and certainly we do have, the department keeps a register of relevant groups, so in fact, there's no question of us actually just focusing on one uh, group or whatever, just to actually uh, echo our, our views. We essentially go for widely with consultation, and then we listen to see where, where we are. And certainly, I think we are very conscious, and I think some of the victims groups are very conscious of the fact where I've spoken to them in the past, you know, that, that most victims and most victims groups um, often actually come and say they're less concerned about the punishment rather than actually not happening to anybody again. And, you know, certainly victims often actually have a more mature view than they ex yeah. you expect. And in fact, they, they actually have suffered some terrible damage, uh, but they don't want them to see anybody else having the, their experience. And I certainly, in this area, the re re Rehabilitating offenders, getting them so they actually don't reoffend, 
is actually a, is a safeguard against future, um, future, future people falling victim. So I think that's obviously a consideration. But Andy, perhaps you can just pick up I see who, the range of people we did actually consult upon. Yes, I mean, the, the, the department holds a, a consultation list that, that runs into the hundreds, and, and it's, you know, the, the consultation is issued to those groups at the same time. There's no group or group of respondents whose responses are weak. The information that this is, is analysed through the prism of the best law, what are the impacts, if there are impacts that may disproportionately affect one group or yeah. another, what mitigation measures are there that can be put in place in order to, to remedy that. So in, in this case, I, I have to say, there wasn't any stark cases where people were completely opposed to the idea of reform or you know, not only, main, you know, even in a worst case scenario, maintaining the existing regime as being appropriate enough, but suggesting that rehabilitation in itself shouldn't be possible or that people shouldn't be able to put their convictions behind them. But that's not to say that the people don't necessarily have concerns with, with the legislation, but yeah. what I would say is that the concerns are perhaps more around the public protection concerns, and yeah. as Brian touched upon in his opening remarks, there's a, a second related piece of legislation which sets out a number of accepted professions, and those are working with children, vulnerable adults in the medical field, financial sector, law enforcement. So those are all areas where a person's conviction will always come, be taken into consideration if a person makes application yeah. to be employed in those realms. So there's, and on top of that, again, we also have the safeguarding arrangements, the vetting and barring arrangements. So there's tiers of additional protections that, um, that I think the victims group take comfort in that, as Brian had said, they, they don't want to see other people experience the, the discomfort that they have. And we view the exceptions legislation as that ultimate arbiter, that ultimate protector yeah. of those concerns. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I just want to pick up on a few points there that were mentioned. Um, I know that um, with regard to the chair's comment on it, it's not the one, it's not the kind of the option that was consulted on, and I appreciate that in terms of the proposed way forward that it is different. Um, Andrew, I think you said that NIACO had been involved post consultation um, and, and, and had sort of agreed. Have the um, Human Rights Commission been part of that conversation as well? Not post consultation, but we we know from the direction of travel that the judgment um, in the case that the human rights case uh, that the human rights commission supported um, that the remedy that we are offering is actually going further than the court recommended remedy that the human rights commission were supportive of. Okay, thank you. And also the. Um, I know you again. You sent you said about Ni um, Niagara, and I'm bringing up some um, other. Um, what would you, how would you put it? Completely lost the word. Other kind of conviction, not not convictions. Yes. Um, and other um, other not sorry, other not custodial sentences only, but other types of convictions. Would you be able to give me a wee bit more information about? Is that kind of looking at all sentences? Being under the scope of the legislation being reviewed, or or what what are you looking at in terms of there in terms of the review? We had a general liberalisation insofar as I think we felt that the old line, which as, as I think it, so, um, it was noted, was dates back decades, um, was a time where in fact perhaps desistance and actually sort of working how you actually work with offenders to stop them offending was uh, much more poorly developed. Um, so ultimately, in fact, we felt all of the all of the, the whole range of of, of uh, points uh, was actually set too high, too well, essentially too low. So in essence, even for a minor offence, you actually had it not spent for a, quite a, quite a period. So when we looked at this, the whole, the whole, the whole uh, range has been actually adjusted uh, accordingly. Now, after Andy will just give you some of the examples of that, since he has, <laughs> since I left that 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 sheet of that that. <laughs> block of paper in my, on my desk, but uh, go ahead Andy. Yes, um, it's perhaps a little unfortunate 
on our part um, in designing the consultation that perhaps our, our focus was more on the custodial elements and the, the upper limit, the, the bright line upper limit. Um, but certainly the, the review is across the board. And um, one of the most common conviction that's imposed in the courts by a significant way is a fine. Um, over 50% of all convictions handed down in all of the courts are fined. And under the current regime, a fine would have a rehabilitation period of five years. And that doesn't change dependent on the value of the fine, so that's clearly no longer proportionate. Yeah. And under the terms of the new scheme, a fine would have a rehabilitation year of a single year. So the, that was an issue that uh, NIACRO and UNLOCK in our, our consultation engagement event were very interested in, in learning what the department was doing with, with disposals for those lower level convictions. The issue that we're dealing or considering at the moment are things like court orders where there isn't a conviction. So things like a, a, dis you know, a disqualification order or a prohibition order, um, a community order, those types of things mm. have, there's, there's a catch-all category in the current scheme, which is something which isn't catered for in the table of rehabilitation period set out, as in something that doesn't have a dedicated entry is covered with a catch-all five-year rehabilitation period. And again, for, for something like a community order that maybe only runs for the length of a year, that's not proportionate either. So we're looking at where England, Wales and Scotland have moved in terms of those types of court orders. And we're looking to, to maintain that consistency for all of the low-level offending and convictions and disposals so that there's, there's no disparity of treatment between the regimes, but you know, looking at the unique situation of Northern Ireland, the, the population, the conviction types, the conviction rates, the reoffending rates, we see an opportunity to, to look at a different approach for the upper level of offending. Um, England and Wales, as, as the, the documents have, <coughs> have given indication to, they're, they're opening up their scheme to all sentences of over four years, but not for those that are serious sexual, violent or terrorist offences. And those offences are all specified in a piece of legislation, but the, the piece of legislation runs to 179 individual offences. So it's very difficult for an ordinary member, it's very difficult for a practice legislator to navigate that type of scheme, never mind an ordinary member of the public, if that's not a a poor choice of words. So we could have looked at doing something similar in a Northern Ireland setting with the, the 2008 order, but again, our equivalent legislation lists 120 individual offences. So it's not user-friendly. You get, you get the potential for, for conflicts where you set a low-level limit where any offence or any conviction of up to four years for any category of offending can become spent. But anything over four years, no matter how little over four years the conviction is, can't become spent just because it's a categorised offence under that schedule. So we've, we've looked, and, and again, as I mentioned with the Chair, the option that we developed um, was built upon information that was provided to us as part of the consultation response and upon our own further analysis of that statistical information. So we, we feel that we're in a good place that it future-proofs the legislation against potential addition, additional judicial challenges like the one that, that the Human Rights Commission have just supported. And going even further longer term and touching upon the, the, the question that Sinead asked, building in a, a review mechanism, which unfortunately we can't do as part of this exercise because it would require primary legislative cover, which would take some time to develop. That really does take us to a unique place. And interestingly, I spoke with colleagues uh, or counterparts, as it would be, in the Ministry of Justice in Westminster about our proposals. And the response back was, that's a good direction of travel. So I see us as being to the forefront of where the legislation might lead in other ways, in other places. And certainly Scotland are, are 
moving that direction with their independent review mechanism, but there's not the same direct read across between their jurisdiction and ours because of differences in the court system yeah. and they have sheriffs that can consider disclosure uh, or uh, request for disclosure information not to be in included in certificates and whatnot. So I, I hope that that addresses your, your questions, Rachel. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just have to sort of do just the, the review that we, of, of, of sort of the lower level and, and they, the, the court disposals and that kind of thing. As a non-conviction, that is that's a, occurring, but you do need primary legislation for cover for that, or do we need? Is it primary legislation needs to happen first, and then that be looked at? No, the the if we're able to complete it in time for inclusion in the secondary instrument, that this would be brought forward by it'll be included in that. If we need to take a little more time to to get that completely right, that would be a separate secondary legislation instrument. Okay. So, so it's not primary legislation no. by way of a bill. Okay, no, thank, thank no. you for that. It's just only, that to clarify. Only the big independent review mechanism for the, the sentences of over 10 years would require okay. primary legislative cover. Thank you for that. Um, two final very quickly ones. And just in terms of the, um, the proposed way forward, any changes to the rehab um, periods and the convictions becoming spent, that would only be applicable to basic access NI checks. Is that correct? So the spent convictions will still appear on standard and enhanced access NI checks? Yes. Okay. And has there been any work done to sort of look at, even with that, that, you know, there's still, I'm um, earlier on about barriers to employment and so on, um, but would that not still um, mean that people will face barriers to employment, you know, accepting in the regulated positions where such checks are required, obviously, um, if they're working with children and, and, and vulnerable adults, but has that been looked at in the proposed way forward? Um, it, it was very much a part of our thinking, but there was a judgment in a Supreme Court ruling in 2018, which touched upon these areas, and the, the judgment ruled that in those instances, the employer is best placed to consider the relevance of, of those convictions to the potential employment. What we have done um, is looked at ways where um, we, well, we've got the, the filtering scheme, which is takes old and minor convictions completely off a person's criminal record. Um, we're the, the limits on that being restricted to one offence has been lifted. That was a direct consequence of that Supreme Court judgment. So where we are at the moment, in terms of the enhanced disclosures, person under the rehabilitation legislation, the benefit is that if a, a conviction is considered spent, that person need not self-declare that conviction as part of the application process. Then, separately, um, there's the application to access NI for the disclosure certificate. And if the, t the intention is that the two sets of information would marry, and if there's a reference to a conviction on the certificate, the access NI certificate, which doesn't match what was, what was declared, the individual has the opportunity to go to the independent reviewer of criminal records to look at the relevance of that conviction to that position that they're seeking employment in. And the independent reviewer, if they take all of the information in the round and are satisfied that the conviction is so old and isn't of any relevance, that it can be removed from the certificate before it's put to the employer. So there, there has been work done there, and no doubt there's, there's still work that can be done and will be done, um, because I know that Access and I have, I work very closely with colleagues in, in that part of the department. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking at ways that we can both open up the disclosure and declaration regimes, but also not reduce any element of public protection. So it's, it's, yeah, it's maintaining that careful balance. Yeah. I might add as well, Rachel, that in fact, in another work which I've done on reducing offending in, in the last 10 years, um, clearly the, we're also working, I know the prison service and others are working with employers 
um, both because essentially it's not in anyone's interest that people come out of, a, out of prison uh, where they may have got some rehabilitation, they may have developed some new skills. When they come out, no one will actually give them a chance to get, uh, get into employment. So I know we have been working with some of the more progressive employers. Well, we're trying to work with a range, but uh, certainly some of the more progressive ones have, have engaged with us. And certainly that ranges, you know, from, from yeah, the, well, the well-known sort of um, little company that actually may, uh, cuts keys and mends shoes uh, right through to, you know, quite a range of bigger organisations. So the part of that is about getting some of those employers even into the prisons to actually work with offenders before they, they, they re they're released. And certainly there's been some quite good results there. So, in fact, you know, I, I think it isn't just about getting spent. It's also about getting employers to take a more, more mature view mm -hmm. of offenders because ultimately, in fact, it's in all our interest that those people come out, get into some sort of stable employment and actually don't re-offend. If, if they can't get work, they're either on the, on, the, on, on the dole or on their social security or else it's too easy for them to slip back into old ways with their, with their, friend, with their mates. So, in fact, um, the, you know, this seems to be, needs to be tackled at both ends. It's both looking at how we deal with spent sentences so we, we give better opportunities for people to actually be able to set them aside, but also how we work with employers and others so there's a more mature view about them. And actually, we do give people who sometimes offend when they're very young um, a second chance. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Rachel. Peter? Yeah, j just briefly, I mean, I uh, appreciate it. So if I was out for a minute or two, so if you maybe, if you've covered some of this ground. Uh, first of all, I suppose, uh, I know you've given assurances on the level of consultation, particularly even as well with victims groups, and I appreciate there, there may be more of a consensus uh, with victims of crimes on this issue than maybe some other issues. Yeah. However, I think it would be useful, I suppose from, from experience quite often with dealing with various victims of crime, you can get two people who will get, who are victims of virtually identical crime, maybe even the same crime, so sometimes can take very different attitudes to that. I think it was just from an assurance point of view, I think the first thing is I think it would be useful, I know, like Andrew had mentioned, there was a, a fairly wide range of consultees on this. I think if, if that hasn't already been, if it's shared with the committee, I think that would be helpful. So we can certainly do that, yeah. Uh, second point, I suppose, just wanted to make and check out. Um, from what you've said, I appreciate uh, the point that's made in terms of older minor convictions and also then, probably also because of a certain level of both appropriateness and legal restriction, that there's a bit of a differential between um, what may be described as very low-level convictions in the way that those are treated and those of a more... Um, serious character. Uh, can we just seek assurance in terms of those of a more serious character? I think from what you've said that um, that in terms of the treatment as regards rehabilitation and the, the approach that you're taking, uh, that you're not creating any level of disparity for those um, who have maybe received a similar level of conviction, but um, if I'm putting this right, the right way, uh, but there's no disparity on the grounds of motivation on that on that basis. No. I think that I think that's useful because again, maybe just to, uh, I suppose maybe make a point on from an earlier comment that in this session, um, I suppose if you like disparity on that grounds has um, on the criminal justice system has not always been treated people entirely equally, and we've seen I suppose particularly going back around about twenty years where there was a particular category of of criminals who were involved with uh, troubles related um, uh, criminal events who were treated in a, uh, were given a, if you like, a superior treatment than... That was the, that was the executive office uh, program that... Well, yeah. uh, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really going even pre-devolution to the situation where there was early release of, of those who were oh, involved in... in all no, I mean, no, I appreciate appreciate that. And that was really national policy, actually, rather than sort of... Uh, well, I, specifically, no, I, I'm not, to be fair, it, it, it predated the existence of the Department of Justice, so it's not a site on that, but it was just to put on record from that point of view, I think it is right that uh, the people are treated equally because within this society, I'll just make it clear, there was no such thing as political prisoners uh, from any section of the community. There were those who broke the law and broke criminal law and... Uh, I'm glad to see that, at least in terms of any form of potential disparity, the department is taking a view that 
ensuring then that people are treated equally, uh, and I think that is right, rather than some given favourable treatment. But I think that's more of a comment, really, rather than maybe a question. Uh, treated on the basis of the sentence, that's essential. Yeah, no, I, and I think that, that, is, that is fair enough in that regard. OK, members, any other questions? OK, if there's none, uh, I thank Brian and Andrew for staying and doing this session. They've been here now considerable length of time. So uh, on the basis of that, I think you've met the threshold for you to be released. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> you, may, you may have cramp on your legs at this point. <laughs> I, uh, I was worried about deep vein thrombosis from, uh, from doing... Uh, some of the speaking notes for the consideration stage to be at earlier in the week over the weekend. So definitely, a, definitely an excuse to get out and get a bit of air and a bit of a, a walk now. So thank you. Thank you very much, members. Thank you very much, Thanks. members. Thanks. Just to, to uh, sort of bring this to a conclusion, there are a couple of issues that we have asked for uh, on Department One in relation to the list of the consultees uh, uh, and also. Uh, Andrew's going to provide us with the information in relation to the, the JR case. So uh, we'll come back to this issue whenever uh, we have got those responses. Great. Thank you. Uh, agenda item seven is a draft supplementary legislative consent motion. And members, uh, we have a number of a bits of uh, business to get through. So if, if you can bear with me, we will endeavour to get through this uh, as uh, quickly as we can, but not to just gloss over the detail. So, page 201 to 211 of the meeting pack, uh, you remember that at our meeting on the 3rd of February, the committee noted the executive had agreed in principle with a proposal to extend the Northern Ireland by way of uh, legislative consent motion, the provisions in Chapter 3 of Part 2 of the Police Crime Sentencing and Court Bill. Covering the extraction of information from electronic devices insofar as they relate to Northern Ireland, and that the commencement of those provisions will be conditional on assembly agreement to consider whether the code of practice following the public consultation complies with the, the protected rights and requirements. The committee indicated that it was content with the proposal. The allegedly consent memorandum. Uh, for a draft supplementary legislative consent motion for the Police and Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill was laid by the Department of Justice on the 7th of February and the committee has now 15 days from the date that the memorandum was laid to formally consider and complete its report to the Assembly on the proposed LCM. Just to seek your views that you are content in principle with the proposal to extend to Northern Ireland the provisions of Chapter 3 of Part 2 of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill insofar as they relate to Northern Ireland and that the commencement of these provisions would be conditional on the Assembly agreement to consider whether the Code of Practice following the public consultation complies with protected rights and requirements on whether any further information or whether any further information or clarification is required. Are you content? Great. Thank you. To advise members then that a draft report on the committee's consideration of the LCM will be prepared for consideration and agreement at the committee next week. Agenda item 8 is the SR 2022-24 Coronavirus Act 2020 extension of provision related to courts, tribunals and inquests order Northern Ireland 2022. You'll find that at the relevant pages of 213 to 234 of the meeting pack. This statutory rule is made under the powers conferred by Section 90 of the Coronavirus Act 2020. The rule has two purposes. Firstly, to allow a coroner to hold an inquest into a death in the prison caused by natural injury uh, without a jury. And secondly, to allow courts and statutory tribunals to receive evidence wholly or in part through the use of audio or video life links beyond the 24th of March 2022. The committee agreed at the meeting on the 13th of January that it was content with the proposal for the statutory rule, which the Department has advised in correspondence dated 27th of January, will be subject to the confirmatory resolution procedure rather than the draft affirmative procedure as originally indicated. The Department has advised that there has been no change to the policy content since the SL1 was considered by the committee and the examiner 
of statutory rules raised no concerns on the technical elements of the statutory rule in her report dated the 4th of February. Uh, and this is to ask the members, are they content with the statutory rule? Content? So I will put the question that the Committee for Justice has considered SR 2022 forward slash 24, Coronavirus Act 2020, extension of provisions related to courts, tribunals and inquests, order Northern Ireland 2022, recommends that it is approved by the Assembly. Agreed? Thank you. Agenda item nine is an SL1, domestic abuse information sharing with schools uh, regulations, Northern Ireland 2022. And you'll find the relevant information at pages 236 to 307 in today's pack. The Department of Justice is proposing to make a statute rule which will be subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure under powers conferred by Section 26 of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, Northern Ireland 2021. The rule will enable the Department to bring forward regulations to provide for an operation and compass model for Northern Ireland, which is a police and education early intervention partnership, enabling support for children and young people who are experiencing domestic abuse. The draft regulations have been prepared by the Department of Justice in partnership with the Department of Education, the Department for the Economy and the Department of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. The committee therefore agreed at the meeting on the 3rd of February to ask the Committee for Education, the Committee for the Economy, the Committee for the Envi Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs for their views on the proposed regulations. The committee also requested a more detailed report and the responses to the targeted consultation on the regulations and clarification of what regulations required to be amended to bring older pupils in special schools within the scope of the scheme from the Department of Justice. The Department has provided the information requested, including a detailed consultation, analysis and clarification of why pupils aged 19 in special schools cannot be provided for under the scheme. The Committee for the Economy has indicated that there is no objection to the proposal and both the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs and the Committee for Education have advised that they are supportive of the proposals and have requested additional information from the respective departments. So are we, whether, are we content with the proposal for the statutory rule uh, to provide for an operation and compass model for Northern Ireland or whether we require any further information? Content? Great. I think it's good to see this making progress because I think it will have uh, advantage uh, in our schools. So, Agenda item 10, the SL1, the Police Act 1997, Criminal Records Certificates, Relevant Matters Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2022. You'll find the relevant pages at 309 to 320 in the meeting pack. The Department of Justice is proposing to make a statutory rule subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure to explicitly provide for the new domestic abuse offence, convictions of the domestic abuse offence with child uh, aggravators as well as current convictions for other offences for which there is a domestic abuse aggravator to be disclosed as part of the Access NI disclosure process. Provision is also made in relation to the disclosure of a non-court disposal for the domestic abuse offence on standard and enhanced applications. Are we content with the proposal for the statute rule that we require any further clarification? Content? content. Agenda item 11, an SL1, the Insolvency Amendment Rules, Northern Ireland 2022. The relevant pages are 322 to 332. The Department of Justice is proposing to make a statutory rule and subject to the negative resolution procedure to provide uh, permanent procedural rules for the company uh, monitoring procedure amending the insolvency rules Northern Ireland 1991 and ensuring that procedure rules for all corporate insolvency procedures are contained in one instrument. The permanent uh, rules will rep, uh, replace temporary rules which are due to expire on the 30th of March. Given the insolvency service in the, is in the Department of the Economy is the policy lead 
for this subordinate legislation. The committee agreed at its meeting on the 27th of January to seek the views of the Committee for the Economy on the proposal for the statutory rule. The Committee for the Economy has indicated that it has no objections to the proposed statutory rule. And as to put to the committee, are we content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Content? Great. Agenda item 12. Department of Justice Draft Budget 2022-25, consideration of the committee response. You'll pay, find that at pages 113 to 130 of the table pack, uh, the committee draft response on the Department of Justice 2022 draft budget, which was also emailed to members yesterday. The committee for Finance is coordinating the responses of all the statutory committees uh, in regards uh, from the budget and has asked for these by tomorrow. A response has been prepared based on the key issues raised in the oral and written evidence provided by the Minister and departmental officials and key justice organisations and stakeholders over the last few weeks. Members were asked to submit any proposed amendments to the draft by response uh, by 10.30am this morning to enable those uh, who are uh, uh, putting all this together so that that can be uh, finalised and also to enable uh, to be circulated in advance of today's meeting. No amendments were received for circulation. And so, can I just check that we do not have any other oppo uh, proposed amendments? If there is no amendments, then uh, I will uh, put to the uh, committee uh, that the members Sorry, I just didn't get this right. I seek the agreement of the members for the response on the Department of Justice 2022-25 draft budget be submitted to the Committee for Finance. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Members, that brings us to item 13, the development of a joint secure care and justice campus. Me, for Chair. Sorry. Sorry, there was just one other question we wanted to ask the Oh, committee. my apologies. Um, if the committee would be content that we publish the oh, yes. previous committee responses on the Department of Justice draft and final budget and the Department of Justice budget 2020-21 on the committee website. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the item agenda 13, the development of the joint secure uh, care and justice campus for children on the, Woodland, the Woodlands Lakeview uh, Lake Wood site. And this is an update, and you'll find that on pages 335 to 486. As requested following the joint evidence session with the Committee for Health on the 1st of July, the Department has provided an update on the development of a joint secure care and justice campus for children on the Woodlands Lakewood site. The Department has outlined significant progress in a number of areas of the programme, including health and therapeutic care, education and training, standards and inspection, community based services alternatives to PACE and remand admissions and engagement with staff and uh, young people. The department is in the final stages of developing, developing options regarding the overall governance and accountability arrangements for the new campus for consideration by the Ministers of Health and Justice and it is anticipated that a decision will be made before the end of this mandate. And to ask members, are we content to note the position in relation to the development of this provision, or are there any further questions or clarification required? That intent. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 14, simplifying the legal aid approval procedures for the engagement of expert witnesses and family proceedings in the Magistrates' Court's outcome of the pilot project, and it's a written paper. You'll find that at pages 488 to 518 of today's pack. The department officials provided an overview of the results of the consultation on a proposed pilot scheme to simplify the legal aid uh, approval process for engagement of expert witnesses in family proceedings in the magistrates' courts at the meeting on the 20th of October 2020. Following the evidence session, the committee agreed that it was content with the department's proposal for a year-long pilot scheme to take place from the 1st of January 2021 and allowed uh, psychiatrists and psychologists to be instructed in public law proceedings in family proceedings courts without having to get prior authority from the legal services agency, provided that they work within a fixed hourly rate and within a certain number of hours. 
The Department has now published the information on the initial evaluation of the pilot scheme, which indicates that the extent of the uptake of the General Authority and the feedback from the Sh uh, Shadow Family Justice Board has been positive. The Department now proposes to commence a formal review and, depending on the outcome, proposes that the General Authority for psychologists and, and psychiatrists will be extended to other court tiers for children order cases and other case types uh, with any modifications which are deemed necessary. There will also be an analysis of the data for other regularly used expert types with a view to standardising rates payable. And it's for members to note the position unless we have any further information or clarification that's required. Agenda item 15. Civil Legal Services Financial Amendment Regulation 2022 consultation and it's a written paper. You'll find that at pages 520 to 530. Another meeting on the 16th of December, uh, the committee noted the department's intention to consult on the proposal for a statute rule to make it possible for the redress payments for victims and survivors of historical child abuse in care in Scotland who are now living in Northern Ireland to have their payments disregarded for the purposes of uh, civil legal aid means testing with the aim of enacting the regulations prior to the election period. The committee noted the intention to consult and requested further information on the, project, the projected financial impact on the legal aid budget and whether reciprocal arrangements would be put in place in Scotland and this information was provided by the department on the 6th of January. The department has now provided further information on the final implications and indicated that the business case is still to be finalised and will require approval from the Department of Finance. Taking account of the time required to complete this and to undertake a public consultation exercise, the Department believes that there is insufficient time for these regulations to be laid within the current mandate and now intends to make these, this legislation as early as possible in the next mandate. And it's to note the position of the department unless there's any further information or clarification required. Gemma, what's in? Gemma? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it's just, I don't want to hold this up, like, but I'm just wondering, I think like when the department were in or whenever they gave us the, the update in December, did they not say they wanted to legislate for this in February 2022? Yep. Um, but yet their business case isn't even ready yet. So I just, I'd like, I'd be interested to know what, what has the, been the delay you know, if they thought they were on track to legislate for it um, this month, but now the business case isn't even ready. Um, so I, I'd just be interested to know what happened there. Yep. Okay, we'll write to the department and seek clarification. Because the other difficulty is, it will, it, if that is the case, it hasn't gone yet to the Department of Finance. And it may be that when it goes to the Department of Finance, there will be other questions that may be raised. So the time scale, and I suspect that that's the reason why they're saying that they're not going to do this in this mandate. However, your question sounds good. What took us to the point of delay that it hasn't even got yet to the Department of Finance? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, agenda item 16, the Adult Restorative Justice Strategy and Action Plan update. You'll find that at pages uh, 523, 532 to 676. And the departmental officials attended our, the meeting of the committee on the 4th of March to outline the results of the public consultation on the development of the Adult Restorative Justice Strategy for Northern Ireland and the proposed next steps. Following the evidence session, the committee noted that the department would provide the draft Adult Restorative Justice Strategy and Associate Action Plan to the committee for consideration. They have now provided the strategy and a multi-year action plan which has been developed by the Multi-Agency Restorative Justice Working Group and on a co-design basis with statutory, voluntary and community sector partners. The recommendations of Judge Murray in review of hate crime and Sir John Gillan's review on serious sexual offences in relation to restorative justice has also been considered. Subject to the views of this committee, the Department envisages publishing the strategy and the action plan by the end of this financial year. The Restorative Justice Working Group will then have responsibility for overseeing the progress on individual work streams. Are we content with the Adult Restorative Justice Strategy and Multi-Year Action Plan uh, in, as set out in the papers, or is there any other comment that we want to make? Rachel. Rachel? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we're content with the, the strategy and, and action plan and certainly welcome this coming before the end of the mandate. I have a couple of questions just on it. Um, resourcing and funding for this strategy. Yes. Um, we just want, want to know what, what, what bid or if any has gone in it. Um, I've been banging on about this for two years as well, uh, where the Centre of Restorative Excellence is. It was promised under A9. Um, wondering if we could get an update on when that is um, due to, to come, if, if at all. Um, and also, in my understanding, and I could be wrong, that current restorative justice organisations' budgets are being cut provisionally again this year, um, the same issue last year. I'm just wondering if we might be able to write to the department clarifying the current um, budgetary offer to um, alternatives in CRJI, um, just they do incredibly important work in our communities yeah. and certainly would hate to think that um, that they we're having budgets slash when we're putting through strategies to increase adult restorative justice and yet the ones yeah. that are operating yeah. fantastically are potentially yeah. having their budgets cut. Okay, agreed members on those C issues right to the department. Thank you. Agreed, thank you. Thanks for that Rachel. Uh, that brings us to 17, is that right? Yes. Thank you. The Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, Northern Ireland 2021, and the implementation of, of Section 28 of the Domestic Abuse Waiver for Legal Aid. And it's a written paper, and you'll find that at pages 679 to 743. Uh, and just to remind uh, members that at our meeting on the 13th of January, Committee considered an update provided by the Department of Justice on the implementation of the Domestic Abuse Waiver. And we had requested further information on a number of issues. The Department has now provided further information requested in relation to the online business case, which is in the final stages of approval, engagement with the voluntary sector, the evidential test, and the communication strategy to raise awareness of the waiver. And it's for members to note, unless there's any other queries. Rachel? Thank you, Chair. Um, very quickly, I'm just wondering if, uh, it just says that the business case is in the final stage of approval, but my understanding from a previous update is that this was due to effectively go live on Monday. So um, but just if, just if maybe if we could get a, an update on the, from the department on the commencement um, of an operation of the waiver um, and the evidential requirements and if this still is to come into operation on Monday, whenever the rest of the uh, domestic abuse offence is due to come into operation. Okay, agreed. Thank you, members. <clears throat> then we have uh, agenda item 18, is correspondence. There are 15 items of correspondence uh, in the table uh, pack, and there's also one in, sorry, one in the, in the, the main meeting pack and one in the table pack. And just to remind members that seven of these items have been brought forward from last week's meeting. And apologies that we uh, maybe gave a fright to some members when we <laughs> see Rachel laughing. <laughs> she panicked when she thought she'd missed the whole meeting whenever she saw everything in t today's. But uh, we had to move some of the information into today's meeting because we ran very late last week. So uh, thank you for your indulgence in that. And apologies to any member that I caused stress unnecessarily to. Uh, but you'll find all the uh, information there. And just that uh, I'll draw attention to one of the items in the meeting pack and in the table pack, and then if members have any other items that they want to raise. It's item 18, 11, page uh, 1033 of today's pack is correspondence from the committee for the executive office seeking this committee's view on the executive draft investment strategy for Northern Ireland. And just to advise members that a public consultation has been launched on the draft strategy, which is cross cutting and covers investment in transformation of the justice system. And it's to seek the agreement of members to request the views of the department. Uh, of justice on the draft strategy and any implications for the department and justice agencies and its non-departmental public bodies. Read. Item 1817, at page 32, uh, 132 of the table pack, is an invitation from the committee for the executive office to attend a, a virtual stakeholder session on Thursday, the 24th of 
February from 10 to 11.30 a.m. The Executive Committee, Office Committee is organising a virtual stakeholder session on the subject of violence against women and girls and proposes uh, uh, to add value to the current consultations on the domestic and sexual violence and abuse strategies and equality, uh, equally safe strategy. And it's to uh, advise uh, members really if they could let the clerk know if they wish to attend that event. And are you content to action uh, the items of the correspondence is set out in the cover sheet unless there's any other comments that members have to make? Agreed? Thank you. You'd be glad to know there's no chairman's business to cover. Uh, and there is uh, one item uh, of any other business and it is that the Assembly Engagement Office are looking for members of Justice, Education and Communities Committee to meet with uh, a gentleman who I will endeavour to pronounce his name, uh, Mr George Gatterloss, who is a member of Parliament in Greece and is a representative of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. That will take place at 11 a.m. next Thursday in room 21. Uh, he is, uh, the, the gentleman in question has been appointed by the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy as a rapporteur for the report on the impact of Brexit on human rights on the island of Ireland and is visiting the Assembly as part of the fact-finding visit. For further information, you'll find that in pages 134 to 137 of the table pack and again, if uh, any other members wish to attend, if they could let the clerk know. Any other business member wants to raise? If there's no other business, then uh, our next uh, scheduled meeting is next uh, Thursday, the 24th of February uh, at 2.30 p.m. in the Senate chamber uh, following the joint concurrent meeting, and just to remind members that there is a joint concurrent meeting with the Health Committee that will take place at 1pm on that day. Can I again thank you very much for your time, thank you for your participation and your help, and I wish you a good evening. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is